Sorry. I'll shut up. Bye. Good morning and welcome to Office Hours, everybody. Great to have you here. Uh, it is Thursday, and as always, we are here on Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do on officehours.global. Our first hour, always a general discussion of production and IT-related topics where we answer audience-submitted questions. The second hour is typically a deeper dive into a specific topic. Today, we are talking about... Um, how things go when you are loca uh, doing a s location survey, uh, what to look for, what to think about, uh, how to figure out what problems might occur so you can solve them before they become problems. So we'll have an open discussion about that in the second hour, but our first hour is entirely questions. So that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, Mitch, what have we got today? Thank you, Bill. Our first one comes in from Alton Christensen in New York, New York. Can the team recommend a simple and reliable Bluetooth teleprompter controller to use with an iPad and teleprompter premium app? A one thumb solution. A game controller isn't working out very well. And so far, nobody's clicked in on this. I, I know Alex has one that he absolutely loves and recommends all the time. Unfortunately, he's not here right now. Uh, Courtney, do you have some thoughts since you're our teleprompter guru? My thought is don't use anything wireless. Use a wired control because huh. one thing you don't want is suddenly to have your teleprompter control latch onto somebody's phone or something else in the middle of a show. So, and yeah, that would not be good. Never no. use Bluetooth for, you know, anything uh anything professional, you know, for your own stuff maybe, but I don't know of any that really work. Okay, fair enough. Noah, you had some thoughts. Yeah, I'm kind of with Courtney on that a little bit. Um, I would use maybe, or a C if you can do this. I, I don't have experience with this, but um, an iPad to USB and then try to do a hardline um, controller. I know there's a rotary controller from prompter people. So I'm kind of curious to see if that would work with an iPad setup and then you would have a wired control set of wireless. And I know in theory, it sounds good to be wireless, but to Courtney's point, point Bluetooth is not always uh, super reliable. So um, if you need that, you know, something that must work, then I, I would go with that wired instead. Sky. I think it's called uh, Teleprompter Pro, and it's an app on uh, the App Store. And it, it has two uh, different tools that you can download, the iPad that goes in the, the camera, and then the phone does have the app to do the controlling. So we were controlling the iPad with the phone at a very close distance. So I agree with all of my, 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 my team people here, but... Uh, I think that's what we used, and I'll try to look that up for you. And Mitchell? I haven't used it yet, but this little uh, guy here uh, came with my ICANN. It's got a little thumb control on it, nice little button on the top. I don't know if it's Bluetooth. I don't know if it's wireless, uh, some kind of wireless, because there's no uh, cords on it. So um, I'm not really helpful, but whatever this is, it works great, <laughs> I think. And what I typically do, there's a program called Teleprompt. Plus that I use out of the App Store. And I always use it with two Apple devices. Typically, I'm using an iPad of some form for the teleprompter in the mirror sled. And I use my phone. And it's been reasonably reliable. I can't think of a time it's really failed on us. Uh, I don't think it's as stable as wired things. But I've been lucky. I usually can be very close to the teleprompter. And I don't do anything really crazy with it. So, um, and, and maybe since... Uh, Alex has popped back up. Alex, we're talking about teleprompter controllers, and you have that that fabulous one that you always recommend that you say is the best one on the planet. Do you remember what that is for our question? I don't remember say. I remember talking about a teleprompter being the best, best on the planet. I, I, I um, something's best on the planet. Maybe it's a remote that. control. Maybe it's some sort of remote control I, you always go to. No, I, I. Uh, oh well, that's for slides. I, I use the the the. Um, uh, Sam. Uh, DSAN. DSAN. Q. That's what I was the thinking about. Yeah. yeah. But but this is, um, we typically, I mean, we typically have a teleprompter operator that is using whatever they're using. If we have to fill in to do that, we use Teleprompter Plus okay. generally. There you go. Perfect. All right. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida weighs in. Can you suggest a lighting diagram for a press junket interview set? Thanks. And Alex is going to start us off. Yeah, I mean the big the big thing is is that typically for a junket, um, what you have is you, you'll have a poster back here, and then you'll have your subject here, and then sometimes you'll have another poster here with the interviewer here. So that's kind of the, the very standard junket um, that's there. Um, and uh, what you you know what you want to do is you typically have a light up here that's kind of doing both both of these, 
that are kind of doing down lights on them. If you do up lights on them, it looks like, a, unless you're doing a horror film. If you're doing a horror film, it's great, but it looks a little bit like a horror film there. So you want these to be mounted up above. And a lot of, a lot of these, the way that those work is they pull them up and there's a, there's a uh, structure for that, for that. So the structure is coming up behind it, holding the poster, and then it has a light that pops out or a couple lights or a long light that will pop out and, and light the poster um, that's behind them. Um, and then, and then you have, um, then typically you just want big soft light for them. Um, you want it to be at an angle. You're going to want to use, um, uh, honeycomb on the front so that, it, so that the light coming off of the large source, which will be, uh, anywhere from three to four feet, um, on either, on either one, you don't want it to ble bleed out very much. So if you put the honeycomb on the front and you have these three to four foot, um, now some people use little lights for this and those junkets don't look as good. So, um, so anyway, so the ones that, that, that make the actors look good and the reporters look good are, are these, these much larger ones that will come out. And so the key is the posters oftentimes are bigger than you would think that they would be. They're more of the big movie posters as opposed to little ones, because we try to push them back. If we've got room, typically this is in a, like a conference room in a, sometimes it's in a hotel room or, a, you know, at, a, at like the Beverly Hills, uh, um, the one that I've done most of the junkets that I've done are at the, uh, um, Beverly, Beverly Hills Four Seasons. <laughs> so, so that's, that's where they, that's where most of them get done anyway, though, that I've been on. Um, and, uh, great bandwidth, by the way, they have a lot of control. Um, and so, um, but you, we, we try to get to a large enough room where we can get, uh, we can push those posters back as far as we can, but we need larger than life-size posters so that they look normal, but they're further back and then we have bigger lighting on them. That's when it works, um, you know, and uh, a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times it looks pretty cheap. And so, um, but but those are the ones that look probably the best. The other thing to think about is also whether the junket, you know, the, what I've, I've just seen most of those, most of the, <clears throat> what I'm doing there is having people connect over Zoom or Hangouts. Um, so the, there is uh, one layer of press that gets to come in and hang out with the VIPs. And then there's another layer of press that we build into a, into a, uh, a single point to point um, with uh, with them. I think the actual interviews with the point to points uh, over Skype, Hangout, um, or or Zoom uh, are much better. <laughs> they look they look much better than because one of the things that we do is we we give them the the interatron, so the actors are looking right into the you know they're looking right at the person, and I find that it's a it's a much better experience. So because um, we we deliver them back the same high res footage, you know, they're not using it through Skype or Zoom or, or Hangouts. They're getting oftentimes 4K footage that they can use. And I think that when we rebuild it and do it that way, it's a, it's actually a better experience. And I think the actors like it better. The actors don't really like, uh, I wouldn't say that the actors don't like the press, but they don't like so many of them one after the other, um, in their space and shaking their hands. And you can tell that the actors are kind of grossed out by the whole thing. Um, when you're there. So uh, having them at a, at a clinical distance uh, as opposed, you know, through a screen is I think what most of them would prefer. Um, not, maybe not their producers or directors or, or whoever's managing the, the, um, the, the junket, but I think the actors would prefer everyone to come in through a screen. Um, we, we found that they livened up a lot more when they were in front of us than when they were in the standard junket uh, setup. Chris Van Rick has some thoughts. Historical reference, standard junket uh, back a thousand years ago, when I used to work on junkets, they were all shot standard def. They were shot in a, a row of breakout rooms in a hotel, uh, you know, meeting area. Um, all the cables, giant bundles of cables from all the video and audio was run down hallways, across ceilings to a ballroom where all the recorders yeah. were manned by one group of people. So the individual techs, and they would literally have a room <laughs> for each of the stars and the reporters would just parade through every 15 minutes. And in a few hours, every reporter that got invited to the junket, I mean, if you think about it, the, the term junket really is like, we're gonna go on a uh, extravagant trip to a fancy place that nobody really should have to pay for, and yet we do it to make everybody happy. But it was amazing being involved in those things, just the amount of pre-pro and production. I would go in just as an audio tech and just sit there and adjust the two mics and make sure that the tape guys down the hall and sometimes on another level in the hotel, the amount of cable they ran was hysterical. It was a weird time. 
Alex has a re- replay thought. I mean, the, and there's good there's good ways of doing junkets and bad ways of doing junkets as well. The, the junkets that were that we went to, like at the Four Seasons, eh, they're, they're above average. Um, the ones that were really good were ones that were. Um, so I think uh, one one company takes everybody to the Ritz in um, Cancun. And they have all the junkets at one time. And so they have all the things that they have planned for the rest of the year. And they have the, they, they do screenings and then they have the press there and the press get to mingle with all the stars. And then the, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a really nice hotel. Anyway, so it's, and it's, and it's, uh, and you, and you're walking down the hall and like Katy Perry walks by and then there's Will Smith and they're all walking through and there's, it creates this ambiance of just, in, and they go insane. Like it is the they build out the ballroom into spaces that feel like the movies and the it's a it's quite a it's quite a thing uh and and that i think it creates a distortion field for the for the for the uh press that is much different than just showing up at a at a hotel and doing your interview and getting it done because you're, it's a whole experience they bring the whole press in um and um and so they get to stay at the ritz and they get the, they get wine and dine and this is like i don't know how I many it's like 50 people in the press they're the ones that the one the, the ones that they think matter um that that are there and so that's a that's a really great approach i i highly recommend it and hopefully my recommendation will get me a ticket for the next one. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, anyway, so, so anyway, we're, we're no, all no, looking it's, it's forward really to coming with you and joining. I know, you know, no, I, I'll never get invited. So, um, but but it was I was there to do production for a, for one one of the shows, and so um, and I didn't get to stay at the Ritz. I stayed at some hotel down down the street. <laughs> it was much less expensive. Um, anyway, but the uh, the other one that that's really great is when they go to a location. You know, we did this one. Uh, we referred to it as Swath, which is um, Snow White and the Huntsman. Every movie has like some some way that you say it. That's the it's some version of the initials. So, so we just considered it swath. And, um, and, uh, at the last minute we were asked to, to go there and it was at a castle. So it was a snow white thing. And it was at a, at a castle. And, um, the funny, just the funny story really quickly, cause I don't think I've told the story. Um, we sent, uh, one of our guys and it was so last minute, we just put them on a plane. And when they got to London, we were like, just get on this train and go down South and you'll go to the right place. And we'll, we'll, we'll give you more, more instructions. Cause we didn't know, we didn't know where the castle was and we were doing another hangout and it was with, um, Francis Ford Coppola's son. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and for some reason he had a leopard in the, in the, in the, um, and the funniest text, one of the funniest texts in pixel core ever was, an angry text and from from London going, I need to know where Snow White's castle is. And and the response was, Can't talk now. There's a leopard in the hangout. <laughs> so so it was like and it was and that's when I looked at it going, we're in a really surreal moment here. Um but the uh but taking the actors to a um a, a unique place as opposed to putting posters behind them. Like if it's if you're talking about something, taking people to it is a much better, much better place to do a junket if you can pull it off. And there's an Andy Kokendorfer uh, answer in Mickey Makachor's chat today. Uh, it says, ask your DP. The answer will vary depending drastically, depending on the look you want, the locations, the framing, the actors, and so forth. And yeah, um, you say that you're going to be do- looking for a lighting diagram. So you may or may not be lighting this yourself. If you are, um, most of the softboxes, what you want, I agree with Alex 100%, you want nice broad sources. Most of those softboxes will have a fabric grids delivered with them because each fabric grid is different. You can use hard uh, honeycombs on the front of them, but that's a little more difficult to travel with. But anyway, it sounds like you've got a lot of great ideas. Let's go on to the next next topic. I've got a question here. What's the best way to recover from a case of the ATEM Gray on Zoom? And Guy's going to help us out. Yeah, the best way is not to get there in the first place. So I would suggest two things. Uh, one is to throw some kind of HDMI capture device instead that is a, a little bit more stable because what's happening is when a 1080p pull comes it can trip that system and and lock it up. So uh, if it's happening due to heat, then there's other issues with um, getting some kind of Aaron Parkey stand or 3D printed stand and blow some, some, keep it cool. Uh, But yeah, I I would just say get some, some other capture device because yeah, I got burned a couple of times and then I just stuck, stuck a riser capture card in between and then never happened again. Courtney's up next. Well, Mitch, if the Greys are taking you onto their ship for a probing, you're in trouble. But if it's just the Grey on the ATEM, then you just power cycle it. I power cycle it off, wait about 10 seconds, power it back on. And when you power it off, that'll take you out of Zoom. It'll turn off your video in Zoom. Wait till it's completely rebooted and loaded all of its media before you then turn your video back on in Zoom. And that's always worked for me. Mitch. 
I have that uh, great uh, switch that uh, Tom Ferguson found. It's uh, on the back of my power supply, so I don't have to mess around with the uh, power ca cable on the back of the ATEM. But to be honest with you, cycling the ATEM um, is strange because when I have the gray, I always look over to see if the multi-view, if my camera is making pictures, and it is. So there's something going on on the USB connection between the, uh, uh, the ATEM and my Zoom. Uh, through my Mac, and I'm not sure what that is. I've heard rumors that it's best to have the USB connected directly to the Mac and not through a hub because there's some kind of negotiation problem happens. Alex? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely the, just the interaction with the, with, um, the computer or, or with Zoom specifically. We've not seen it with anything other than Zoom. Um, so it's something that Zoom's doing specifically to it that, that is having the ATEM do that. Of course, uh, Guy's uh, solution is is the most stable. I, I have to admit that I just, um, I unplug it, wait 10 seconds. I unplug the USB and the power. I wait 10 seconds and plug it back in and it pops right back up. I don't even turn off the video. <laughs> I just I just pull it out, wait for a couple minutes or wait for a couple seconds, put it back in. Um, the one key is to make sure you save your start state. So wherever you, I say, I do that pretty often um, is I save my start state. Um, and then I've now gotten into the habit on Sundays of just restarting my um, May Tim. Now, a lot of times now, right now, I'm re I've been redoing my system, so I'm turning it on and off all the time. It's something over time. So we don't know. I have a feeling that it's something like that's 32, 64, 128 bits, like 128 requests. It it comes off a bit or something like that because it's it's the number of times you're connecting that seems to have the effect. Um, so if you're not connecting very often, you don't get it very often. And if you connect a lot, you get it more often. Um, I got it for a while up to once a week, but now I see it maybe every couple of weeks. It's not, it's, and it never happens once you're in, it happens when you're trying to connect. And so, um, but save your start state. So that takes all the stress out of it. Pete Sargent has a thought. I was about to say, I've actually seen it switch in back uh, when I needed to do this, I had to go back and forth between Microsoft Teams and Zoom, and it would lo lose its mind with the gray screen just going between the two. So, Alex, I've seen it happen with Microsoft Teams as well. And Fenwick. So I'll, I'll say this about everything that we're talking about. <clears throat> when it comes to troubleshooting, it's, it's an important, like, big umbrella thought to keep in mind. You have to keep track of every little detail. For example, John and I both have the same computer. I use OBS at John's recommendation every day, all day long, no problem. He's currently having problems with it. Alex, you mentioned um, powering down, I would you say like once a week or something, the ATEM. Um, one thing that I know is different about the way I work and the way that John works is at the end of the day, John just walks away from his computer and I shut everything down every day. So that one thing might be the difference between John having problems with OBS and me not having problems with OBS. And it's important when we think about the troubleshooting, uh, uh, just the logic behind troubleshooting is that every little thing could be a difference. So it's good to ask a lot of questions when you're trying to figure out why one thing is giving you trouble versus somebody else. I think that's a, a yeah, smart diagnosis. I know I've found out that the problem was something I completely wasn't thinking about. I was doing mindlessly without giving it a, a part of the algorithm, a part of the step-by-step -step process. So yeah, good advice. Let's go on to the next question. From Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. Tony asked, is there a Parsec solution for managing small house of worship service? There are three Windows and one Mac machines I need access to. And we don't have anybody weighing in on that at this point. I don't know if we have anybody who's a Parsec um, ninja here. Alex is going to give us some help. Alex? I mean, it could be Parsec or TeamViewer or many other solutions. I mean, anything that's going to screen share, you just have to get it set up so that they're ready to, to do that and figure out what, ex I don't know which one is the inexpensive one. Or I think that we use it, um, typically any desk, I think for the kind of our least expensive just has to get on um, solution, but I don't. I don't know which one is the right, I mean, from a cost perspective as well. And uh, Noah. I asked a similar question last week um, and I got some great recommendations. I'm gonna follow up with somebody about Apple's built-in um, desktop sharing, which is cool, but I, I've settled on Chrome remote desktop temporarily at least. Um, and we'll see, yeah, I've used Parsec once or twice and it, it's faster and it does pretty well. So you might give it a try. And Guy Cochran. 
Yeah, Parsec for the Mac isn't very good, so I wouldn't recommend that. So Parsec's mainly if you want a high frame per second with great color. And so it, it's one of those things where um, Zoho Assist, TeamViewer, it depends on what you want to do. So if you're trying to do video, there's there's way better options. But if you're just trying to take command of something, then we use internally Zoho Assist, which is uh, one solution. Another one is, uh, of course, TeamViewer, uh, Chrome. Chrome Remote Desktop is another free solution. It just depends on your login and how you want to get into those as a user. So are you trying to admin for the PCs? You could also just use good old Remote Desktop, but you will need a, a Windows Pro license for those machines. And then on the Mac, um, I'm using, if I have to remote in, there's there's other VPN ways of doing things, but it just depends on how complicated and do you want to get deep into the network um, settings and, and admin and that kind of thing. Tony, I hope that helped you out. Let's go on to the next question. From Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California. Noah asks, where do you order gobos for lights? Any good tips? I have a client who wants their logo projected onto a stage wall or floor. Courtney. Wasn't he one of the Muppets, Gobo? Um, no, you get them from the people who make all those gels. Roscoe will do custom uh, steel gobos for your ellipsoidal and Lico lights. Uh, they make them in steel uh, in any size. They custom cut them with lasers. And they also make a version, let me see if I can find it down here, uh, the plastic ones and uh, even color ones. So um, there's where you go. That yeah, I've ordered those Roscoe. custom colored glass ones. They're really beautiful. They're, they're really nice if you have a good uh, focused fixture. And that's why he was talking about a, a, a Lico, an ellipsoidal fixture is usually what's used. That or a pattern projector, which is a technical light. Chris Fenwick has some thoughts too. Yeah, I just did a quick super search uh, on this Noah. Uh, there's a guy called Goboman.com. Oh, there you go. Goboman. Sounds perfect. <laughs> Let's go on to the next question. Goboman. Uh, so, Douglas Carmichael's in with a question. If human interpretation would be too expensive for every show, could it be useful for certain special events, like IBC and AB coverage, for example? combined with strategic marketing to build the Office Hours brand in those geographies. And Alex. I, you know, I think it could be. I, I, I think that we'll have to definitely get to it. It's pretty expensive to do a long run of, of that. So it, it would be something that we, we'd probably use autom automatic for a while, uh, mostly, beca mostly because that wouldn't, it, it's actually pretty close, and I'd rather be testing, to be honest, the AI version and trying to figure out how we deliver that more effectively um, because it's it's more sustainable for us uh, given the, the the amount of that we do per per day. Makes sense. Next question, please. Next question in from Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Following on form from yesterday, what video export formats are less susceptible to loss of sync than MP4? My 15 gigabyte 1080p output needs compression to two gigabytes or less for transfer. The footage is sports from Resolve Studio on a Mac. Compression via handbrake. And Mitch Hill is going to help us. Um, there, any compression of any kind is going to uh, run into that problem of long gops and uh, uh, keyframes. And the more keyframes you have, the better. Um, but um, I just think that you need to sort of uh, deal with the fact that Pro, uh, ProRes is going to get you the best results for editing purposes. Alex, it, it's ugly, but we, in times when we need to, to do the to do what you're talking about, where we have to we have a small pipe to to do the transfer, and then we have to do it. We basically what we call deflate and reinflate. So basically, we take it, convert it to H.264. On the other end, we push it back to an editing format, an intro frame format like ProRes. We edit it and then compress it back down to to um, uh, to H.264. And so, or H.265 if you want. Um, but the point is, is that you uh, you compress it just for the transfer and then you uncompress it and put it back into a container that's going to manage it properly for editing. And then you're going to send it back. Um, uh, uh, you're going to compress it back down again. It's not good for the overall visual quality, but we've used it in a pinch because we couldn't move the ProRes files um, in, the, in the environment that we were in. Courtney. One thing you might check is uh, don't if you if it's available on Handbrake or whatever you're using to compress it, don't use variable bit rate if it's at all possible. Use constant bit rate, and that's uh, variable bit rate is one of the things that creates sound going out of sync because it varies depending upon the contents of the frame, how much, uh, how many you know, 
pictures there are between the iframes. So um, constant bit rate keeps the bit rate consistent and it's easier to calculate uh, you know, where the sound goes that way so it stays in sync better at constant bit rate. But at two gigabits per second, you may have to be a variable bit rate. That's pretty, pretty small. Alex? I think it's two gigabits for the file <laughs> is, is, the, uh, is the size there. Um, but the, uh, uh, I, I would not use Handbrake in a production environment. I, think that's, I, I use it. I, I've used it for a lot of things. I use it for personal stuff. But I would not, I would not do that. I would use either media encoder or, or compressor you know, for, for that. And on a Mac compressor, because it's about four times faster than media encoder. And just because it's bit me more than anything else, I'm assuming that you're looking at whatever the deliverable is and making sure there's no actual drift in that. Uh, 99 times out of 100, the drift, uh, if I ever run across it, comes from audio sample rate being wrong for the format. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I think if was, you've seen it and this it's is, good. This, I think we discussed that yesterday, and it's a long gop issue. It's a long gop to, to video uh, audio issue, not, a, not necessarily a sample rate issue, I think. Yeah, that would make sense. Uh, all right, moving on. Next question. Next question in from Guy Cochran in Seattle, USA. Guy wants to know, when will the bird dog play ship? Guy Cochran's going to start us off. It's today, finally, after months and months of them saying that they were going to ship it, that it, it, it's happening today. So for those of you that don't know what it is, it's just a little $149 device that takes uh, uh, NDI and spits it out uh, via H. So it takes in NDI and spits out HDMI. So you can do it with an Apple TV, but then you also need the the app. So I'm excited to see these things actually ship because we had like a hundred of them on back order. So for those of you that were looking at how to get a how much NDI into your ATEM, 149 bucks. So this should be shipping nice. from wherever wherever you get your stuff. Nice. All right. Next question. David Brady, New York, New York asks, looking for a method to combine Tuslink devices into one. Are there any caveats to doing so? Yay and A. Looking at this product, and he shares a link, uh, J Tech Digital. Uh, no one has raised a hand on this. And uh, Toslink Digital Audio, I'm not sure I've ever seen anything that I guess it's, it's, it's muxed audio, as I remember. So you'd have to demux it, combine it, and put it back together again. That seems like a little iffy. So I'm not sure if there is any way to essentially combine why two Toslinks into one. Courtney, am I? do you know something else? Yeah, I've never heard of doing it, but I would think you would have to somehow synchronize them. So you'd have to be all on house sync or something for your variable, for your uh, digital streams that are coming in over Toslink. So maybe this this device uh, actually, you know, resyncs everything, buffers things and resyncs them. So I don't know how well they'll stay in sync. But to mix them together, they have to be in sync. Yeah, two word optical sync. audio yeah, signals pulling them apart and putting back together would be a little. I think take some calculation. Mitch, do you have a thought on it? I think Courtney's right because the device, if you look at it, and I briefly look at it, it took uh, it takes four inputs and can switch them or mix them to two outputs. So in order to do that, you definitely have to have sync among all the inputs. And is the device that does that? Do you know what it costs? Is that a, a an inexpensive? Didn't, uh, didn't look there. I should have. I guess thirty two dollars and ninety nine cents. Thirty two ninety nine. Well, that's a yeah, lot it's a four by two matrix. Thought. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, then I guess there is a good solution that's inexpensive. Uh, keep your fingers crossed and let us know how it works for you, David. Next question. John Wallace in Pontiac, Michigan. New Sony camera, Sony ZV-1F, one-inch sensor, 20-millimeter fixed lens, functions as a USB webcam. Who's going to test it? Probably quite a few people, but David Paskin's up next on the, our list. I, I'm not going to test it, but <laughs> it is an interesting little device. It, it's it's $200 cheaper than the ZV-1, which I use as sort of a secondary camera. It's got a USB-C out, which you can go direct to use as a webcam. It's missing a lot of the other IO. It doesn't have a hot shoe. It doesn't have a, a headphone monitor. Um, I, you know, at this price point, I, I kind of wonder, isn't your phone with all of the, the, um, uh, the machine learning and processing that's happening on the phone, isn't that going to be just as good as this kind of camera? Yeah, interesting question. Noah? It definitely looks promising, especially it looks like the lens is a 20 mil equivalent, right? So it means obviously with a one-inch sensor, it'll, and it'll be equivalently like 20 mil at, you know, a full frame lens, but it's a F2, which is 
pretty good. Um, the two kind of concerns that I have are around power and the USB power specifically because uh, smaller cameras like this can overheat and that's why I use a full-size camera for uh, my webcam and then for USB-C if it's going to be uh, able to be powered and if you can do long streams like we do you know two plus hours uh, of live streaming with it. Mitch Hill. Yeah Sony's been dabbling in this uh, low-end camera areas for webcams they've started out with the Z ZV-1 uh, then the ZV-E10 which I have and now this Z, uh, ZV-1F. The thing I'm going to be interested, like uh, Noah was saying, is whether you can power it with a USB. Currently, on both of the cameras I mentioned previously, um, you can charge the battery in it with the uh, USB, but you can't power the camera. In other words, it says it's trickle charging the battery. If the battery happens to run out, even if the USB is connected to it, it will stop. Interesting. Interesting, the zoomification of every, all the video stuff out there. I mean, before I'd never seen a camera on USB, and now they're just epidemic out there. All the manufacturers are running there. Alex, thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that the problem they're going to have is sensor size. I mean, you, there's a lot of things at $500 that you can get that are that are larger sensor. And for a lot of vlogging, um, people are pretty sensitive to the sensor size. And so I think that a half-inch chip or a one-inch chip um, at, at $500, there's other things that, that you could probably get that will g give a better bokeh than, than what this is going to provide. I, it's going to be really interesting to see if it, if it succeeds. Noah. I know sometimes, too, the mirrorless and other um, DSLRs limit the uh, connectivity for their webcam, right? So, like, instead of having to go through an ATEM or some other sort of capture device, basically you do direct, but those resolutions tend to be really limited. So I'm kind of curious to see if they give us... 1080p with this or what the resolution would be um, as far it, as far as it being a webcam as well. And uh, that 20 millimeter lens, that seems awfully wide. I know Alex has talked about before about not having things be too wide when you're talking about your primary desk camera. So uh, too much room and not enough you. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, oh, David has a thought. David Paskin. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to chime in on what you just said. One of the in one of the reviews that I saw, it talked about how because of the lens and the sensor, um, the you can only really um, crop, zoom in to one point five, um, and so it, there. It look, it's a five hundred dollar camera. We're not going to get everything that we want from it. It'll probably be wonderful for. Um, you know, for, for some folks, but for others, it's going to really, uh, it's going to cut too many corners, I think. Fair enough. Next question. Tony Mobley, noon in Georgia, back with another question. Week two of conversations with Tony Mobley using LinkedIn Live is still having some buffering. Chirag and Taylor tested after the show. Any suggestions from the panel? And I just lost a view here. So uh, can you, yeah, Mitch? Me. I'll go ahead and take that one. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so with LinkedIn, there's two ways of streaming in the, the RTMP Direct. You want to pay attention to the settings that they recommend, which is a, a maximum of six megabits per second. And I, I got a little insight as to what was going on behind the scenes. And so it looks like the, the megabits per second from the vMix output on, on your machine, Tony, was set to 10 megabits, which is uh, probably too much. So you want to back it off. The other thing is you're streaming to two de different destinations off that vMix uh, instance. And depending on what the CPU and GPU usage is, I would probably fire up a second machine. So typically when we get into these environments, what we'll do is we'll have one machine that is doing the vMix cutting the show, and then we'll have even another machine that's graphics or ingest, but then we'll have another one that's the encode. So we'll have upwards of four machines, but for you, uh, I think you're using Zoom Rooms for one, so that's your contribution. And then you're kicking, you might need to kick it out if you start to go to multiple destinations or then the other alternative and probably the cheapest and easiest is to go to Restream. So with Restream, you would shoot an RTMP out of uh, vMix. So that would just be the one RTMP out. And then from there, you could kick it over to YouTube and it actually has the hook for, for LinkedIn directly in there. So it, in um, Restream, you, you could see here that it says the best settings for you to use are six megabit max. And then the other the other thing here, where did I just have it? Uh, yeah, here you go. So you could say add destination, and then from here, you would say add destination. You have LinkedIn. It says beta, but it actually works well right out of here. And then you could also do YouTube. So it, it does cost. There is a fee for um, for Restream, but if it solves your issue, then that's the way to go. But those are a couple alternatives for you. There you go. Hopefully, Tony, you have the answer you're looking for. Let's go to the next question. 
Noah Sargent from Fullerton, California. I'm working on a half-rack kit. Apparently, there are some boxes that measure 10 inches between the mounting holes and some with 10.5. Any idea why there are two standards? It's the great thing about standards. There are so many of them. Alex is going to start us off. So, no, you're saying 10 wide or 10 what? So that's the thing that I'm a little confused about myself. So I'll show you the picture. So there's two different uh, measurements here, basically. Oh, it's a half. When you say half rack, it's half wide. Correct. Yeah. So I'll show you the larger picture here. So, uh, you know, standard rack is 19 inches. This is the half rack, which is uh, somewhere between 10 and 10 and a half wide. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've already shipped four of these boxes out to clients for an event that's happening now. But what I've noticed is that that first picture that I showed, uh, I got two different sizes from two different parts. Right. So some some of the parts were actually about a quarter inch shy of the mounting holes. Right. So this is a keystone uh, patch panel that was printed and there's another device that is basically a little bit shy of that width and so um, talking to the person who who 3d printed this keystone uh, patch for me he was basically talking about how um, he saw that there's two different widths and it was kind of confusing to me because um, obviously it's it's not a super common box but it's interesting that there's two different widths for the same device and so it's just not clear on which one is which and what to order you know as far as uh, what will fit and what will not fit in that half rack unit box. Yeah, because uh, I thought Alex. that I thought that they would be nine point five for a half rack because that would be the the width. The actual well, yeah, it, it probably is. My dimensions are probably off. You're talking about just, the, the distance from hole to hole as opposed to I think to, so. Okay. Distance yeah. from hole to hole would be it, the distance of the cavity, I believe, is nine point five or 5, should be nine point right. five. And then it, and if it's something off different than that, then that should there's something wrong. Um, so, you know, I guess I would probably I bet you all of your hardware will fit into 9.5 as far as a width goes. And then what I would do is build it to that smaller to 9.5 with 10 to the to those. And then I would make sure that I had a, a tool to make holes that are 10 point that are wider cut them in to, to, to fit yeah. if I needed. Well, I would I would build proper the proper size, which I be, in, in my eyes would be the 10 because the 9.5 cavity with a with a um, the quarter inch spare, you know, that that goes into the to the uh, quarter 20s if you're using quarter 20s. Um, and so I would I would build it prop what I would consider proper and then adjust things that are improper uh, to that. But, but all the hardware should fit into the 9.5 cavity. Courtney. Right, that's what I was going to say, 9.5 on the width of the cavity, and then you add another inch, half inch on either side for your ears to rack mount. And that should give you 10.5. But uh, so that was where the 10.5, where the 10 comes from, that wouldn't leave you a lot of space on either side of a 9.5 cavity. Uh, so I'd be questionable about the 10 inch. And you can always, uh, you know, make your, if you're 3D printing, print them with uh, little s horizontal slots that are about a half inch wide and, uh, uh, you know, 5 sixteenths or whatever the height of your screw is. Uh, not 5 sixteenths. Yeah. Our woodworking guru, Chris Fenwick, is going to fix it for us now. Yeah. Uh, all I say is this is clearly a standard that is not yet standardized. <laughs> That's right. It's, I've it's never even heard of, of it. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you got something out of that that'll help you get the job done. That's the most important thing, Noah. I'm sure you will. Let's move on to the next question. Graham Codwell from Belfast, Northern Ireland. Following on from yesterday, my source footage is XAVC and 80 minutes long. What would be a good format to convert to before editing with Resolve Studio that generates moderately sized files rather than huge ProRes ones? Guy Cochran. Hey, so you can go on to the app store and get this app called uh, AJA Data Calculator. So we're looking at 80 minutes. Uh, codec is ProRes and resolution, I'm assuming is HD. It doesn't say if it's 4K, but I'm assuming HD. Uh, two channels of audio. Uh, let's actually make that 48 kilohertz audio. Uh, 49, basically 50 gigs. Come on, man. You can go to 7-Eleven and get a one terabyte drive for 99 bucks or 99 cents whatever it's so cheap these days like just get the dang drive and get an ssd and and run with it because you'll have an all iframe codec it's beautiful and then at the end use uh compressor and kick it out but yeah don't so 
use ProRes and then use compressor. Don't use Handbrake and don't try to uh, do other things with other formats. ProRes is a standard and that's what I would use. I, what does it change to if you switch us to ProRes Lite? How much does he save? Uh, let's see. Do ProRes. Come on, Kodak. It was just up on the... Oh, frame rate, da, 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 da. frame rate. Actually, let's go 29.97. I'm assuming that's what it is. And then Perez LT. Time calc, 69. That oh, got 69 bigger. gigs. So actually, uh, no, 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 hold on. Sorry. Um, the frame rate was not set on that one. My bad. Let me make sure. Let's just even go 30 here, then go ProRes. So we're we're at 100 gigs, but still, I mean, literally Staples has these things for 99 bucks for a one terabyte SSD. And so you could edit 10 shows on one $99. So save yourself the hassle, just convert and run with it. There you go. Uh, Alex Lindsay. Time. It's just so much time that you'll save and so much heartache that you'll save by using an, uh, an iframe uh, solution. So yeah, you, you just really, really want to listen to what Guy said is just get a one drive that's a terabyte. They used to be expensive. They are not now. Um, we're just going to keep on underlining. It's just so much pain that, that goes into editing H.264. And Sky. Yes, I was in Best Buy yesterday, and the little uh, SSDs have come down, actually, in price. And Guy, the other question I would have, which ProRes uh, iteration would you suggest? Because you, if he doesn't need the full HD, I mean, full HQ and all of that, because there's ProRes Lite, there's ProRes like three different flavors of Foros. Yeah, I mean, I would run a test at uh, five minutes worth of footage and walk through the entire workflow to see if LT would actually work. So if, it, if he's shooting with something that's really like a one chip, you know, sports, like not a big deal, I go LT, but usually everything that we do is reg Pro's regular or, or HQ. So it just depends again on the turnaround time, the source footage, if it's GoPro footage or something like that. And if you're going to apply some kind of color correction to it. Because he's not going to make it better by up it to the, the big HQ kind of a thing. So just keep it at whatever the camera source was. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. One-to-one -one from there is always a good idea. Next question. Next question. Dave Odin from Johnstown, Colorado. Is there a way to activate the tally lights on the Canon CR500 with vMix? Not sure if we have any Canon 500 owners here who also use vMix. Nobody has weighed in on this. Uh, activate the tally lights. I don't remember there being a tally light. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, the 500, I think, maybe does have some sort of tally light. I don't think the 300 or the smaller ones do. So, Alex, you have thoughts? Yeah, I, you'd have to look at whether that tally light is an open standard or whether the problem with Canon, um, one of the reasons we don't use Canon cameras is because they have a very closed standard. So they have a very limited number of things they let you do with a camera. Um, and um, and so it's it's a closed standard, uh, and so you have to figure out what can you do to tell it that it's there. It's probably some version. It's probably designed to work with some version of a GPIO output from a switcher. So what you're looking for is how to convert some kind of communication from vMix, some update from vMix of where it is, to a GPIO output. Um, and then there's going to be some way to take GPIO and convert it into the standard that the camera is expecting to get. The, but the first thing you're looking for is a GPIO connection to a Canon camera, and then you have to figure out how to connect vMix to GPIO. That's my guess. Um, there's not going to be any easy way to do it, I, I don't think. Sky? I was on a shoot with 1F Jeff, and he has found an ancillary box that you can use over IP somehow. I will research this up, but it was magical because I was out on the tennis court, and I had the tally light right there, knew when I was on. It was awesome. Oh, that's nice. Well, it's, it can be done. It's yeah. new. Uh, so maybe try Discord and see if you can reach out to, to Jeff and see if uh, he has that solution. Noah, do you have another thought? I just was going to mention that the N300 also has a tally light, um, and it's noted on the B&H page, but um, maybe uh, Jeff's solution will get you there. Fair enough. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is here with a question. Microsoft Office will be rebranded to Microsoft 365 in November. Um, what does the panel think and why could they be doing so? Courtney. Because every 365 days, they want to extract some money out of your bank account. 
uh, because Microsoft Office, you know, used to buy the package and you'd own it. And it, I'm using Office 2003 <laughs> still because it works perfectly fine. There aren't that many changes that have happened to Office over the you know, 30 years that it's been out that uh, year to year improvements are negligible or if there are any improvements, you know, very like 1% of the office users would be able to take advantage of those improvements. So they're trying to move everybody onto the subscription version of it, which is uh, used to be called Office 365, which is the subscription version. You pay annually for it and they update it, you know, whenever they come up with updates. Uh, and they have different licenses for family or for five users, etc. Uh, so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to move everybody to subscription if they can to get rid of the people like me who still run my old version of Office 2003. So it's all your fault, Courtney. <laughs> Scott Gleason's up next. Well, they're going to give it, send you a five and a half inch floppy, Courtney, and you can shove that. No, that iterations of of marketing to a, a, a new thing allows them to give you the same resources, but better with the new and later later technologies. So consequently, this is uh, again, partially marketing, but I'm sure it's also a lot of engineering that's going on behind the scenes too, to, to give you the value that you're paying for something new. You want a new name. I don't want that old stuff anymore. Mitchell. If they go to subscription, they're going to lose me. Uh, I've been a Microsoft Office uh, uh, product user for quite some time, like Courtney. And um, I don't like the idea also of having to log in to use software because that means I've got to use a password and somebody could get that password. And the security is just not going to be the same as a locked in computer that could possibly even be air gapped versus one that's got to be connected to the Internet to work. And I think that takes care of that question. We're moving on to the next one. Next one from David Paskin in Miami, Florida. In the Office Hours Discord, a custom VDP.ninja page stylized and tweaked for audio-only production comms was shared. Looks really interesting for those not really to invest in a more robust solution. Has anyone tried it? Alex. Can you tell us more, David? Like, how does it work? Can you have multiple channels or is it just talking? I, 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 I have no idea how it works. Um, I, can, <laughs> I can show it to you, though. So um, this is uh, you come in, you uh, choose a name. So office hours, you can assign a password if you want. Um, and then uh, you choose a display name. You do have multiple groups. Uh, so group one, group two, group three, you can join one or more of these groups, choose your audio sources, destination start, and then you just have comms to those different groups. There's also a, a chat, uh, which I really liked. As of right now, from what I can tell, there's no login or anything like that. If you want to get, I was asking the gentleman who posted, I only didn't share his name because I didn't have permission. Um, uh, the only way to get back into a room is to use the same room name, um, as I understand it. So. Noah has a thought. Don't you just love office hours where you could just get like an instant live demo and it's ready to go? I just wanted to compliment David on that. That was really cool. Here, here. Uh, let's move I mean, on to I, the next. I, oh, I, go ahead, no, Alex. The only thing I'll say is that that's interesting is the idea of a web interface that provides comms, right? Because that, that's just a basic web interface. Um, one of the things we have trouble with is getting people to install Unity and then learn, you know, put the stuff in and put all the other things in. So the, the thing that I found the most interesting about what David was showing is just that I could send theoretically someone a link. Just click on this and it'll open up. And I might not even give them multiple groups. It just gives me a talk back to them if I need to, and I could put them into multiple groups, but I could theoretically give them a URL that only went to each person. So here's your URL and it pops up and it just gives them a way to talk back to them. So, um, or I could give them groups too. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it has all of that functionality that, that well, no, I, I, again, I would this just create it. I would just create it that way. What, what I mean uh, by that create is that, different rooms. Yeah. Just, just gotcha. create a bunch of different rooms that people gotcha. just jump into and, um, or, or, and then for production, have a couple of them. And then, and then anybody, anyway, there's a, it, I, of course, I just made it a lot more complicated than what it was designed to do. But, but the, um, but I think that um, a way that you could have a link for folks that are less technical to be able to just jump into comms and not have to call a number, not have to figure out how to install Unity or Agent IC, not have to do any of those things is pretty interesting. 
Oh, Courtney wanted to slip in before we go to the next question. Yeah, one question I had, does it have a, a means of doing a voice of God so that one person, rather than joining each an individual room, could talk to all the rooms simultaneously? You know, like a director would talk to all rooms or you could pick I would do that in hardware. Talk to. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I would just right. build in hardware. Fair enough. Next question. Jeff Cohen, Miami Beach, rendering a few animated slides from a keynote to use in a video project. Which video format would be better to use when exporting out of keynote for this use? H.264 or HEVC? Bonus points for why? Noah. So both of those are compression formats, and I'll try my best to explain and uh, talk about that. And Alex can clean up and make it even better than my answer. But uh, H.264 is the more universal standard. It's been around longer. H EVC is basically H.265, um, and it's an, a newer version, even though there are other better codecs that have come out as well. So if you want a more universal codec, go with H.264. If you want a um, more efficient codec, but it takes a little bit more processing on your computer, then you'll want the H.265. Alex. Yeah, what Noah said. <laughs> he did a good job. <laughs> uh, the, the only thing you have to be careful of with, with animated slides is because it's long gop, it may want to jump. So it may not be smooth. So you, if you're going to go into it, uh, as Noah said, H.264 is a lot m m more readily supported. So you're going to have almost everything or everything that you want to play back is going to be able to play H.264. Only a subset is going to be able to play H.265. The other thing, though, is that you want to put more bandwidth into the, that compression than you would think because you want lots of data there for it to, to work. Because And then when you set that, you want to set its keyframes to a very low, to a much lower number than you would normally do. Um, it'll make a larger file, but you want to set those keyframes to every 10 or every 5. Sometimes you can test it, but if it's set to the normal every 60, you're going to see, you may see bumping as it goes through it because it means every two seconds it's going to, it's going to get a new keyframe. Um, and soft animations of big images are hard, harder for H.264 and H.265 to manage. So you also see this, um, the other place you see this is stuff like waves. <laughs> You'll see them pulsing uh, if, you know, if, if you do that. So um, you may want to turn that, if you're having any jumping, turn down the keyframes um, and then and you, may, you may improve it. You can turn them all the way down to one, which means you're not going to get any temporal compression, but you will still get spatial compression and you'll get a smoother output. Sky? So my, my question is, obviously, if he's using Keynote, he's most likely inside of a Macintosh universe. But would MP4 be an option? Because H.264 is kind of the I would, same thing. I would never wrap anything on a Mac with MP4. Just wrap it with an M, M, a move. It's just handled better. So never, never, I mean, you can do MP4s and you can do M4As and you can do all kinds of other stuff. But, but if you're on a Mac and you're not going to a PC and you're not doing anything else, just wrap it in a move file. Yeah. Next question. From Noah Sargent in Fullerton, California, and here on our panel, he's excited for the Sony FR7 and have one on pre-order. Any other takers? What should I test first when I get it? Alex has thoughts. Yeah, I had the opportunity to sit with uh, the um, the um, FX6 for a, a little bit of time and play with it a little bit, which is the same sensor as the, as the FR7. Um, it's fantastic. <laughs> like all I have to say is just what a fantastic camera. The FX6 is just a really, really great. It's really small and compact. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of stuff that you can kind of build out on it. Um, the autofocus, of course, is Sony autofocus. It's just I was testing it where I'd I'd focus on something and I'd swing over um, to, uh, to to my unsuspecting daughter and I'd swing over to her and she would and she just snap right into focus. And then I did stuff where I walked from a distance to, to the subject. And it just just keeps re, you know just focuses really smoothly. So um, so anyway, so the FX six is a really it's a really great sensor. It has me sold. So um, you know we're looking at doing some events that 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 Noah's seen. And um, and uh, my plan right now is if if we get enough orders for those events, I'm probably going to get four of the FR sevens and one FX six to cut, carry to you know follow people walking onto stage. And then have the other ones just managing all that. So we have one operated and then four that are operated by, still operated, but operated by um, uh, someone who's, who's managing those. But I think that um, what I'd love to see, what I'd love to know when you get it is whether, um, you know, how good is the controls? The controls on the iPad, I'm really curious about how smooth they are. Can you control how fast it, it pans over from one place to the next? 
um, how how smooth are the controls that you can use to to manage it? I believe it works with the Sony hardware, and I will admit my experience with the Sony uh, controllers has not been great. Um, so uh, the the controller that comes with the BRC one nine hundred and one thousand is kind of trash. Um, you know, so so uh, you know, so that's been the the problem that we've had. We've had to use something. We've had to use other things that can talk to it because Sony's own hardware isn't very good. But I'm I'm interested to see how well the the um, uh, the I'm interested to see how how the the iPad version works and how you can do presets and ease in and ease out controls and those types of things. As far as what would be great is be great for you to jump on the show. I'd love to see. I didn't have time to. I thought I would have time to swap it, but there were so many idiosyncrasies with swapping the camera that I have at home. You know, and I felt like it wasn't going to show off anything because there's just a gray background back here. So, um, but I would love to see what you look like on this show with that camera. Um, because I think that a PTZ camera as a, I know that's a very expensive webcam, but as a webcam, I can see this as a high-end solution that we send out to, to clients um, in what we currently use the 6K for. Um, because the biggest problem we have is minor adjustments, focus, um, minor adjustments to framing. All those things are a huge lift when we don't have a PTZ camera, but we, we use it because we want the larger sensor. Now having a full frame sensor that's doing its own focusing and that we can make fine adjustments to, I'm more excited about the FR7 than I've been in about any camera for quite some time. That's saying a lot. Mitch. What uh, Alex said about the FX6 comparison, uh, I find very interesting because my business partner works at a rental house and the FX6 is very, very much in demand, even though they have Aries and uh, uh, Venices, et cetera. Oh, for the price. Yeah, for the price, of course. But the other thing is... Um, I'd like to see if you could strap the maximum lens on there that gets 200 millimeters on that FR7 and see, like Alex said, how smooth it is getting to and fro uh, with that as being the biggest lens you're allowed to put on it. And Noah. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, um, I have the 28 to 135 and the 18 to 110, which have both been, or at least the 8, 28 to 135 was advertised as a kit with that camera. So it can take the weight. It looks like um, the motors are designed to do that. So I'm super excited about that. Like Alex, um, I've not had great success with uh, Panasonic controllers and uh, bird dog controllers in the past as well. So um, the controls to me, um, moving to the PTZ world, I just, I want to have tactile instant feedback, especially if I'm doing multiple cameras and I just haven't seen a good system for that yet either. So those are a couple of my hesitations, but with a robust app that they've redesigned from the ground up, we'll see what that looks like. Um, but for me, I, I have six FS5s that I use for multicam production. And if this camera goes well, I'm going to be slowly uh, integrating those and replacing those with the FR7. Okay, we're we're actually have quite a few more questions left. I know we have a few that are already in for our second hour. We're going to go a little bit over, so let's just try to do this as efficiently as we can. Mitch, next question. Next David question. Paskin from Miami, Florida asked, I know we've talked about this many times, but I continue to struggle with organizations hosting events on Zoom in which the talent look and sound horrible. Are we too far down the path to correct this painful trajectory? Alex. You know, I think that it, it is, it, we're never too far down. And I think we'll continue to try to push this. Uh, <laughs> we'll just keep on pushing it. The tools are getting better. Um, you know, the kits, I think part of it is having people understand what kit that do they need. And it keeps on coming down to us, all of us here, both on this show, as well as, as when we appear in other shows, is to keep on doing what we're doing and continuing to improve our solution. Because I think that what people have to see is what a lot of people see, what they're lacking. I had a friend who they use a a sevens for their webcams, you know, all the whole company, they just issued them all for the company and they they do video production. They had one meeting where all of them were in that meeting and the client was on their laptop and the client has, a, it's a big company. <laughs> they got a lot of money and they were like, how are you doing that? Like they just, they immediately got like when all of them were doing it, how are you doing that? They explained it. They hired them to just equip all of the C-suite with the same, with the same systems, you know, they, and, and I think that when we talk about it, we just want to keep on underlining with people that how people, how people approach your authority, that you know what you're talking about, um, that you are, uh, all of that stuff is affected by the quality of your audio and the video. And it shouldn't be, it's not fair. It should just be all about the content, but it never has been ever in the history of the world. It's never been just about what you were saying. It's how you're saying it. It's how you look when you say it. You know, they, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, those are, those are things that, that make a difference. You know, they, they, they say that, uh, 
you know, William, William Wallace had a lot of good ideas, but he was also six foot seven, you know, land where the average height was five foot, five foot two. Like, you know, like <laughs> this is the reason people followed him around, <laughs> you know, so, 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 you know, and, and you can be six foot seven if you have a good camera and, and, uh, and a good mic. Uh, Mitchell real quick. And then yeah, it's, real quick. it's, it's interesting what the pandemic has done. It's forced us to try zoom and other things like this and have these uh, one-on-one meetings and, the quality is always speak more highly uh, than anything else. Like I've had clients ask me how to do it before I did it myself. And I'd start to explain it to them and it was, their eyes would glaze over. But ever since I built uh, my zoom room here on office hours, every single time that I'm on a client uh, or corporate uh, uh, zoom call, they all say, wow, that's great. How did you do that? And now I have something I can uh, say. So the other part of the answer is that, there were more and more options now than there were when we first started doing it. More and more cameras, more and more mics, more and more situations that simplify the process of getting this kind of a, a picture. Let's try to do at least one more question before we switch over. Mitch? All right. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana. Has anyone gotten the DJI mics using the USB-C connector to work on iOS? And um, I don't see anybody who's popped in on this one. So maybe if nobody wants to handle that, it'd be a good time to come back and do it again when we have a little more time to deal with it. Uh, we've got, what, two more that are in general questions? Yeah, let's see if we can just pop them real, pop through them real quick. Nobody has a hand raised on either of those at this point either, so we may not. Uh, Alex, real quick, do you have a, a note on the NVIDIA the question? No, it looks really interesting. I, I, I think that the... Um this is the this is from Bo Cordell and he's talking about the Nvidia Nerf uh, for for photogrammetry. Um, the, the Nvidia's uh, you know Nerf technology you know they're they're really talking use a lot of machine learning and AI to uh, fill in all of those gaps and I haven't gotten to play with it yet. So, um, but it looks like it also is building images from single a single point of view um, using using AI to do that. And I think and it'll be interesting to see you know how that how that progresses. But we should see if we can get someone from it. NVIDIA to come on and talk about it. So let's Great put that idea. on the list if, if Josh is listening. Let's put that okay. on the list. Let's pop to the next question because Courtney wants to take a swing at it for help north. Noah here, next question. Noah Sargent from Fullerton, California. Is anyone else waiting on the Sennheiser EWDXEM4 Dante 4-channel wireless receiver? My DVE rep mentioned they won't be shipping until early next year. Courtney. I'm not personally waiting on it, but I'm sure there's some sound mixers that are using the uh, sound devices, Scorpios, or anything that uses Dante uh, because it's a good solution for a rack mount, rack mount for receivers uh, with a Dante interface. So, and it's about three grand. So, if you get the receivers, you know, for that price, that's really a pretty good price for the a digital receiver, four receivers, and a Dante interface. Fair enough. All right. We've managed to make it to the top of the hour, a couple minutes over, but not too far over. And we are going to go into our discussion of location scouting. Uh, for those of you who have ever had to do this when you're starting your career, uh, it's amazing if your career is anything like mine, how many things you don't realize you should pay attention to when you go out to the location where you're going to be shooting and um, you make a lot of mistakes in the early part of your career. And hopefully you get better and better at learning how to look at potential locations and analyze what that might do in terms of the equipment you need or the problem solvers you need or just what's happening. Um, I have a little presentation, just a, uh, like three or four slides with just some thoughts. I'm not saying this is comprehensive at all. And in fact, what I'm really trying to do more than anything else in today's uh, discussion of this is to engender questions from you. And I've, for the first time, opened up kind of a Mukana link over to the side of me. So if anybody in the audience has any kind of uh, thoughts about what you do, I'd like the will of the tribe here to, to put in as much different kind of opinions as to what you look for in location uh, location scouting, because everybody's locations are a little bit different. Uh, I spent most of my career in Arizona, for example, and heat and heat abatement was a gigantic issue for me. So I looked at every location in terms of sun control, heat control, and things like that. Now, somebody in a different part of the country would not be as sensitive as I am about that. So uh, here are just a few things. And it starts always for me with my initial client discussion. And I'm just thinking to myself, I want to find out from the client is, am I going to be inside or outside for the shoot, day or night, public, private? That's access and control. Am I going to have to deal with the population? Am I doing run and gun? Or am I doing electronic field production where I have to set up and execute shots as opposed to capturing something 
at an event or something like that. Uh, store hours versus customers. Is it going to be open if I'm doing something in a retail environment? Those are just some of the kinds of things I have to think about. I look at each of these in terms of these three filters for me when I'm sitting down to plan something. I'm always thinking meteorological, and that is more than just is it going to be raining for me, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Then I look at it and analyze it from the technical points. What do I have? And then finally, logistical. Here are some of the kinds of questions I ask, and we're not going to spend any time on these. I'm just going to let you read through them, but I think about whether it's, you know, what's the weather going to be like? What season are we in? Uh, the sun position. I find since I shot outside a lot that that was really important for me. And as I would look at a location, I would say where and where they want me to shoot are the windows. And will that be morning or afternoon sun? And does that matter to me? Uh, shoot time, sunsets. Uh, you can see a whole bunch of things here. Temperatures, that's going to affect maybe batteries. Wind, a tides I've never had to deal with until I came over to Southern California. But I was on a beach not long ago and we had to set up and shoot. And sure enough, they had scattered it at a different time than we got there. And oops, there was no beach left because the tide was in. Um, technical stuff, power supplies. How are you going to power everything? It could be all batteries or not. Uh, HVAC, particularly, I've run into a lot of corporate shoots where you have no control over the air conditioning whatsoever, not even to turn it off. There's no controls there because they're concerned about the cost. So they have an EMS or energy management system in place, and you can't even fiddle with it. Um, some things like, is there? are you anywhere near airports for air traffic and sound issues for that? And traffic, you will see on both this one and the logistical one that's coming next, because there's two different parts of traffic that I always think about, sound and or permits and police and things like that. But there's also in logistical, that same last one in terms of how do you secure the locations when people aren't running through it? And um, Little things like parking, do you need on-set security? Are you going to leave your equipment there overnight? Do you need to get off-duty police in for that kind of thing? Uh, set access issues, you know, do I need people to mind the truck while I'm there because there's some sort of issue with that? And we talked about permits and things like that. So that's enough for just the, I want to start people thinking in these areas and talking about location scouting circumstances you've seen in the past, what surprised you? What did you learn the first three shoots that made the fourth, fifth, and sixth shoots a whole lot easier for you? And this is your chime to kind of uh, share circumstances that you went in and hopefully solve uh, to make things easier on location. And, and again, specifically, we're talking about looking at the location with these kind of thoughts in your mind so that you plan for the day of the first shoot and you can execute everything professionally and well. So Mitch, let's dive into our questions. All right, our first question in from Bob Sturdivant in San Antonio, Texas. I travel the world a lot. Is there an organization site where someone could upload geotag pics of possible sites or look up list of sites of interest? Surprisingly, I have found some success in doing that just using Google search and or Apple Maps. Most of the time you can go anywhere in the world and they have um, bodies of pictures that people have taken from a location. Now, it's not someone thinking about these kinds of things often. So um, I've often been surprised. I've come back from a location scout with a set of uh pictures. And I remember at one point, my son looked over, I said, Dad, you take the worst pictures in the world. I said, Yeah, I, but for a different reason, because I might have taken a picture of an outlet, because it was a GFCI. And I wanted to make sure that we knew that that was there. Nobody else will take a picture of an outlet, but I need to for the location survey. Alex, you had a bunch of thoughts here. Go ahead. Yeah, um, the uh, all I'd say is that I take anywhere I travel, I take research photos. <laughs> like It's like when you do a lot of scouting, you just get used to the fact that I may sometimes, especially if I'm in a venue, if I'm in a venue, I just automatically go into, if I think, especially if I'm in a city that I think the venue I'm in is interesting, I literally spend a half an hour taking photos. Like of the entrance, of, I take, all, I just go into scout mode because I'm allowed to be there. I'm there. There's kind of the question about that future. <laughs> I'm there, I'm allowed to be there. I'm gonna take a bunch of photos. I take structural photos. I take, I probably look like a, um, a security risk uh, because I'm taking all these weird photos of that, that aren't touristy photos of, of what I'm doing. But, but I, um, I, if you leave me alone, also if you leave me alone in a smaller room that I think is good, I was at a, there's a, a bar uh, in, um, in Mill Valley and I was there to see the, 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 the illegals that we've had on. But when I first met them, they were practicing up on the stage and I just went and 
wave my camera around and modeled the entire bar. <laughs> so it's so always like, I don't know if I'll ever do an event here, but I'm going to have the data. And so, um, so definitely be opportunistic anytime you're traveling, uh, take photos of anything that you think might be interesting um, in the future um, as far as that goes. And the great thing about doing it with a phone and not a camera is that you have all the GPS data. We have a nice comment here in the questions too from Adam Mitchell. He said, keep in mind that in many ways, the locations department is one of the least funded and least represented portions of the media production industry, except for one person has a slush fund budget for special needs. Often catering is the largest part of the locations department's funding. And I've run into that too, which is why I think this is good to talk about because you may not have others who can do this for you. And if you want to grow your business, uh, spending more time thinking about what to think about ahead of the production on things like a location scout will will just save you. My experience has been it saved me so many problems uh, just finding out, oh, my gosh, that window faces due east and we're shooting in the morning. And what it looks like now that I got in at four o'clock in the afternoon is not what it's going to be like when I come on Monday at 7 a.m. to shoot this. Um, that, that is something, you know, I'm going to bring something to cover the window. And if I hadn't thought about that, it could have ruined that first setup. Um, let's go to the next question. David Brady in New York, New York. What is the threshold between scouting and trespassing? <laughs> I was going to permission, but Noah, go ahead. And, oh, Alex, Noah, and, uh, Mitch, Alex, go ahead. I mean, in general, uh, we try to get approval to go anywhere we're going that's not a public location. So if it's a public location, of course, we just walk in and start taking photos. Um, if there's, uh, if it's a private location, we usually try to find who's the manager, who can I talk to, who can I meet with, I need a name, you know, and usually that takes time sometimes. you work through it, you try to find out who the manager is. Uh, it really makes it easier if you're walking through a theater or into a venue or whatever, and you can say, well, I'm here to see, I'm, you know, I was here to talk to whoever it is. Um, but you definitely, uh, you don't want to just slide in as someone else is doing a load in. <laughs> Not that I've ever, not that I've ever done that or not, but but the um the, the slide in and just take a bunch of photos of of the location. Um, but be careful also, uh, in government facilities of almost any country, um, taking photos um can get you instantly, you become instantly interesting, and it can be interesting forever. Like just so you know, like like you take take the wrong photos and you get on a list that they start paying attention to you all the time. And so so just be you know be very conscious of uh, government facilities uh, or near government facilities. You start taking pictures even of their cameras on the outside, and um, everyone gets super interested in you real quick. So um, so you just want to kind of keep that in, that in mind. Um, but in general, in event facilities, yeah, we're trying to find the person our our person to talk to, um, set up a certain amount of time. It's one of the things that. I've really enjoyed about having even something as simple as polycam um, in the photos is that I can, I don't have to measure everything. It used to be that I'd go in there with a laser measure and measure each, each thing and everything else. Now I just swap, you know, move my camera around and grab whole rooms uh, and that I can to get all the measurements later. So it makes the, the walk through a lot faster. And before we go to Noah here, I noticed that Mickey came in with hire a local producer fixer to organize this for you and check out World Fixer. So there's a site called worldfixer.com that looks like you might want to note. Noah, your thoughts? Yeah, I actually kind of uh, don't like this question because uh, in, in Los Angeles, at least, they're super picky about uh, scouting and locations and sh running and shooting because it's been so heavily abused. Um, I, I come from an assistant director background. And so I was a stickler when it came to getting permits and getting th things done the right way, because to shut down a production or to put somebody at risk, or even as the assistant director who is in charge of safety, like you're the person who's ultimately responsible for that team and that crew for, for being safe. So um, I, I would say if, if you think there's any chance of you being considered trespassing, like you need to stop and talk to the right person. <laughs> um, it's just better to have more communication than less and, and to go through the right channels to make that happen. Um, the last thing you want is a lawsuit or for um, to, to develop a bad rep because what's gonna happen is more red tape is gonna happen um, when people cross the line. And, and that's why systems develop the, the, the way they are in Los Angeles is because so many people have done it the wrong way. Yeah, you might think that's just New York and Los Angeles, but even for me when I was in Phoenix and things like that, getting on the good side of the people in the permits office and getting on the good side of the police when, you know, I was lucky I had a couple of contacts because I'd done a big event and we always hired off-duty official Phoenix police or Scottsdale police, wherever we were doing the event in order to staff that. So I had a contact inside the agency. So talking to them beforehand and saying, this is what we're going to do, 
when somebody would raise a red flag, you could go, would you please call Sergeant Kino here? And he will tell you that we're okay. We're, we've got all our permits. We have insurance and the rest of this. And it puts you in a different category suddenly than somebody who's just doing this off the street. Mitch? Yeah, you just said it. Uh, it's very important. Um, sometimes I don't have a chance to do a location shoot or a location scout. Sometimes I'm scouting it as I'm shooting it. Um, there is a very big difference that when you have all of the paperwork and, uh, for example, we were shooting in uh, Fort Lauderdale and uh, we had to go with the film commission. We got our permits. We got our insurance coverage and we had to have a police officer uniformed with us. There's a little bit easier uh, access to places you wouldn't normally get into either as a scout or asking permission when you got a full camera crew with you and a police officer and all the documents so very few people will complain if you walk into a restaurant or a, uh, a public uh, location and uh, you have a full-blown crew with you. And if there's any problem, the police officer that you have working with you generally will smooth things out. So uh, we'll call that the minimum uh, scouting because we're doing it in mere minutes before we actually shoot. Alex. Yeah, the, um, uh, the other thing is just ask permission. Like if you're somewhere that you think that you want to take photos, just say, can I take photos here? Is that, is that okay? And, um, you know, if you're there for a scout scout, um, but if you're there visiting or something, just asking ahead of time, it makes, it makes a big difference. And on along those lines, when I, I did a lot of corporate work and I would even walk into a store to do a pickup shot and a manager would come up, even though I was shooting for the corporate office, I found it was really important to make sure that whoever my contact was had contacted a store manager, manager or someone locally and said, please put a notice on your bulletin board that a film guy would come in, you know, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock to do a pickup shot of these things so that you don't just get hassled and delayed. Usually you can work it all out, but it just delays you and there's no reason not to do that. So communication is critically important in these things. Uh, let's go to the next question. Bob Sturdivant in San Antonio, Texas. Is LIDAR scanning a requirement for location scouting now, or is it just something that might have them choose you over the other folks? Uh, Sky and then Alex. Sky? Once Alex introduced it to me and it was available to me on my iPhone and then I could send that little piece of information off to somebody else, it, it became a requirement for me because of the imagination that allowed me to put the cameras in different locations, understand where the lighting's coming from, see the shadows, and what are my obstacles between me and the, uh, the subject that I'm trying to film. So it's, it's kind of magical and that it's available and it's in a low barrier to entry, uh, it's, it should be required. How's that? Fair enough. So Alex? Yeah, we've used LiDAR probably for only five or 10% of our, of our shows. It's, not, it's a very un, unusual thing to, to do, but it's something that now that I own a LiDAR scanner, <laughs> like I use all the time. Um, and so, uh, so the, um, I, I think that uh, it's super useful. That's all I'll say is that it, it now, like we're building out, we have some venues that we work in relatively often and we're building out 3D models of those venues and from the LIDAR scans. And now when someone says, how long, how much room is from here to here? We just go back and go, okay, well, how long is that? I don't have to go back and figure out a measurement that I didn't think of when I was there. I just go back and just go into the scan or into the 3D model that we built that's accurate. And I'm within a couple inches, you know, uh, an inch or two of, of, of anything that I need to go back to. If I want to figure out what are the sight lines and are my lights going to be in the way or, or is this going to be a problem or where do those seats go or whatever. And we're, you know, it just makes it much easier to lay it out. Um, and the next step that we're looking at is even taking, you know, going to the point of taking, building metahuman folks that look like the, the subjects that we're going to have there <laughs> and just setting them in chairs and everything else. Like this is exactly what it's going to look like. Now, does that do you need all of that? Probably not for some of the shows that we do, but if you build a system that makes that not hard to do, that that becomes like an hour of work to put that together. You know, when they, the key that you always have with production is to build up a, an experience for the client that when they, if they go to work with somebody else, the, the fall is, you know, painful <laughs> you know, from, from where, what you were doing, customizing to their solution to what is something else. Cause then they come back and they're so much nicer. So, so the, um, uh, so it's really important to keep on trying to figure out how to really use these, if they can be a low lift, um, they're not super expensive. The client doesn't want to pay for a lot of that stuff. Now we consider scanning, you know, we just put that in our budget because again, we own one. Um, we just put it in the budget that when someone shows up somewhere, they're going to show up with a scanner and scan it. So that makes it, and the, the little BLK 360s are not the best in the world, but 
you can send it out with someone and just say, push the button. When it changes from green to, to yellow, get out of the way. When it changes back to green, you're done. <laughs> that's, that's all you need to know. Can't agree more. And I, one little tool, I'm going to pop this up on the screen that I found really useful. There's a there's a program, and I thought it was just a light meter. It's called Photo Light Meter or Pocket Light Meter. And I was surprised when I started using it. I was just trying to get readings of how much light there was. But actually, it allows you to do take pictures, and it puts a lot of metadata on top of them. So whenever I do a location scout, uh, I just take my phone with me. I pop this open. And it's giving me a lot of useful data about it. And uh, I can usually tell from these i use this in conjunction with the regular camera on my phone the camera does wide coverage of all the little things but this gives me at least some data about the location that i'm uh, at in terms of basic exposure what's the basic light like and i find that really useful i've had that on my phone for probably five years six years now and it's really come in handy uh, in terms of giving me a little overt official data about where I was. And 99% of the time I can use the, those photos to determine my, my most of my setups through the day. Occasionally I change, but it, it, that's just part and parcel. Next question. Sky Gleason of Seattle, Washington. For both cast and crew, what restrooms are available and comfort stations issues? Uh, Noah. Yeah, you gotta definitely consider this. I, I um, was watching Parks and Rec last night, and there was a joke about having 300 people at a park and no restrooms, and they're like, "Oh, we could just use Anne's house." I'm like, oh no, but I'm sure there's some sort of like standard um, ratio between the number of people and the number of toilets. I would guess it's between 10 to one or 20 to one on a set. Um, so I'm sure some locations folks might be able to weigh in on that, but um, to learn from like the bigger cities and, and what they do on the bigger productions and kind of apply that to the smaller productions would be a good idea. Early in my working with PetSmart, I kind of got snapped on this. I was thinking about it in terms of uh, restrooms for their traditional uses, but it turned out we were doing a module on handling reptiles and there was a requirement of hand washing each time we move to a different area to different reptiles. So I did not take into consideration the amount of time our talent would need to break from that shot, go wash their hands to come back over and over and over again. So you get snapped by the weirdest little things. You just have to live and learn sometimes. Sky? Well, and that's what caught me off guard was I was perfectly comfortable with a porta potty and then my talent said, I, I, I don't, I'm not going in there. And so to think about your talent, not just your crew, that was the, the gotcha for me. Absolutely. It's all these little tiny things. And remember, you, know, you might be in public places, you might not. You know, that beach shoot I was talking about, you're having to bring in everything, including porta potties and, and hand washing stations and things like that. And particularly during COVID, it was twice as important as it was uh, for the rest of my career. So these change, your requirements change as time goes on. Next question. Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico asks, do you have at hand any kind of agreement when taking pictures for scouting? Um, my, uh, Mitchell. I can't tell you enough how better prepared you're going to be if you prepare in advance. For example, if you're shooting in a big city like New York, go to the film office, get all the permits. They'll give you parking passes so you can get places easier. Um, they give you the, uh, uh, the information that you can show any official if they stop you and ask what you're doing there. Um, it's so much easier. And yeah, you might pay one or $200 uh, to get those uh, permits, but uh, it will certainly smooth the way for what you got to do. And since we have an international uh, audience, I will pop into the questions here. And Bob Sturdivant made a good comment. Also, definitely try to get a local guide that speaks the language. Like Alex said, it looks like intel gathering or targeting if you're just there doing this without somebody who knows the local language. So um, one more thing, we, I, you know, most of my orientation is being able to work here in the U.S. But if you're in a different country, the rules change so much and you have a different kind of preparation. And I've, I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to international producers producers to say, yeah, somebody local on the ground who knows what we're doing and knows how to talk to the locals is a super important part of this. Sky, you had a thought? Yeah, I realize this is for scouting, but I do keep a notebook in uh, a three-ring binder of, of, of information uh, releases in my trunk of my car because I never know when I might need to get permission and then have somebody's signature that you gave me that permission. Normally that's for the shoot itself on the day of, but uh, also the other concept that 
many of that, um, much of that has gone into iPad formats and apps. So uh, maybe that'll be a different question. Yeah, that's, I, I've run into that. Actually, probably 20 years ago, I had a thing I created. I went to an Alpha Graphics and I had a thing called Ready Releases made. I used my lawyer's basic language, printed it on about a, a five by seven inch card, made them up in pads. And I used to throw a couple of those in my camera bag. And so I always had a basic release ready. Now, of course, as Sky mentions, there are plenty of release apps that you can get on your phone, customize the language as you and or your legal team decides is required. And it's uh, actually easier because it'll keep them in the cloud for you. They're all filed. You know where to get to them all. You can usually take a picture of the person you're getting a release from at the same time. So everybody knows it's a legit process. Um, no way you had a thought on that. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about some of the past experiences I've had um, and the location folks that I've worked with in the past have been wonderful. Um, I have to say they've they've had some of the toughest jobs on Hollywood sets that I've seen because even if you have a permit and you have the police and you have all these things in place, you could still have people come up to you and complain regularly. And so what's funny is um, a lot of production folks just say, well, you need to talk to locations, right? And so they're the kind of catch all for those like uh, community complaints and they're talk they're listening and hearing the person out. But, you know, we're permitted to be here where it's legal for us to be here. And they're the person who's kind of the buffer between production and um, that civilian, right? And um, it's, it's definitely a tough job, even when all of the, those agreements and things are in place with the local business, there's, there could be other community members who are affected by that uh, shoot. Absolutely, Sky. Well, Noah, I'm curious if that person is called the fixer. I've, I've heard that sure. term. And what is, it, what, is it, what is your definition of a fixer? And what is their job? Yeah, for me, the fi a fixer is more of a producer who just makes it happen and figures out a way it is like there's no no, you're right, they, they don't settle for no, they figure out a way to make the production move forward, right? Um, for me, that location person is almost a fall person, right? Just someone to catch the ear of that individual and figure out a way to not disturb production, right? So um, when you have 60 or 100 or 150 people all working on the same show, um, anytime that disruption takes away from pr principal photography, like that's costing thousands of dollars, right? And so there's been interruptions that I've been a, unfortunately been a part of, and that locations person is to tr um, trying to find a way to minimize the time taken away from set, right? So that we could keep doing our job and they're trying to pull them up to the side and try to figure out a deal. I've seen cash deals happen just to make stuff move forward. Um, just because, you know, a couple hundred bucks to them is in a, is, not a big deal to the thousands of dollars they're saving on set. Mitch? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out that uh, what Noah says is so important because if people are getting a little more sophisticated and if they want to scam the uh, the production crew by just being annoying or asking, hey, what are you doing? What are you shooting? What do you, you know, you need somebody to smooth that out. And if it's not done properly, it can really be a problem. And like uh, Noah says, maybe a few bucks uh, will, uh, will solve the problem. But then, of course, other people will catch on too. Well, I've, I've used location coordinators occasionally. One of the circumstances where I find it's really useful is if I'm dealing with multiple jurisdictions. We shot a bunch of stuff in uh, parks and, and national scenic things up in Sedona and things like that. And so you're dealing with possibly the county, the reservation, maybe or maybe not um, the National Park Service, uh, maybe the Bureau of Land Management, and just trying to figure out who is in charge of this, who do I need to contact somebody uh, so that I don't make the mistake of showing up and, you know, saying, we've got it all set with the sheriff's office. And they go, no, we're the Bureau of Land Management. You didn't talk to us. And you go, ah, OK, sorry. And sometimes a qualified location um, manager, a location scout that you find locally will have done this enough in a particular jurisdiction, a particular area where they can really smooth things over so you don't get in trouble, because if nothing else, they'll know who it is that needs to put their name on the bottom line to make these problems go away. Alex? Also be careful that of asking too many questions about what you can and can't do, uh, and, or, and, and also just making sure that you fill, follow back up with email. Uh, I, I was in a situation where I asked someone a lot of things about what can we do and what can't we do, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. They said sure to just about everything. And as soon as we got in the next day to load in, the person was like, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> like, you can't do that at all. And that was, so I was talking to a person that, was telling me yes, but didn't have any authority. So make sure that you know who, where people are on the food chain. Excellent point. Excellent point. Next question. 
from Noah Sargent here on the panel and in Fullerton, California. Has anyone used Sunseeker? It's a game-changing app that shows the path of the sun over different times. Yeah, I use it all the time, Alex. Yeah, we use it all the time. It's great. Sunseeker is a must-have app um, that have it. Now, the other thing you can do also is if you're building models uh, for outdoor things, uh, SketchUp will also tell you, show you can have the sun go where it needs to be um, so that you can see how those things are going to um, get hit. Um, but Sunseeker, uh, as far as an app, uh, is, is really, really great. Mitchell? My uh, DP, Tom Shistek, has uh, pulled it out before and... Um, I'm amazed how, you know, just a DP will know that those are issues you need to be in. And, and you're not always worried about that. You might be worried about where the next shoot is going, whether you're on time, et cetera, et cetera. So it's great to have the right tools to do the right job. Yeah, the two that I use most often, and I actually had them because I was going to put them in the show, Sun Surveyor is actually the one I use, but it's the same basic thing. You take it out of location, it knows where you are, It know, you put in the date that you're there, and it will actually show you the track of the sun over the course of every hour. And it's a live thing, so as you move your phone around, it geolocates the track of where the sun is going to be for this position in this direction. So you know when you're pointing your camera west from this location, Here's going to be the path every hour of the day, and it saves you a lot of hassle. The other thing I always have on my phone is uh, called Commander Compass, and it is a highly precise compass and level um, height manager. And so I never go on a location scout without at least my phone making sure that those both are loaded up and working. Uh, Noah? Those definitely look super helpful. For me, <clears throat> the, the AR that you're talking about where you can basically point your camera at the sky and then basically track the sun's trajectory, like it seems like both apps do the same thing, which is super, super helpful. Yeah, I can't tell you the number of times, even inside. I mean, you think that would just be a location scouting circumstance, but in a ballroom, if there's a glass wall over there, I want to know for sure, based on what time we think we're going to do setup three, which is in that room, where's the sun going to be? And is it going to move into a position as the day goes on, particularly if we're late getting to that setup, that's going to cause a problem. And I may know based on that app and where the sun is going to be that with the overhang on the building, I have until maybe two o'clock to get this shot executed. And after that, I'm in trouble. I may have to push to the next day or I may have to you know, make sure I have pipe and drape to cover that whole side of the ballroom. That's not fun either. So those kind of apps can really uh, make your life a lot easier and help you do a good job. Next question. From Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana, do you always use checklist when you do your scouting? Alex. Alex. Uh, I don't always use them. Um, it depends on the type of scout that we're doing and whether I've shot there before and so on and so forth if we're looking at them. Uh, we always send out a pretty, uh, always send out a list of someone's um, going for us. Uh, we usually send some list. That I, I would love to say that it's better formatted than what it is, but it, a lot of times it depends on what I need from that venue. So like, I need you to f find these things. This is the stuff that I'm working on. I don't know if I have a general list. There are some, I mean, definitely we have developed in the past, like this is the general list of what, what what's happening. But if you have someone that doesn't know the event very well and just kind of goes through the list, it feels very odd for the person on the other end because you're asking, you're trying to go through a list of things that don't don't apply to this. So a lot of times we discuss a fair bit before someone we send someone in. Like I need you to take, like for instance, photos. <laughs> you, you, saw, uh, you, you can often get a very detailed list from me of the photos I need. Where I need you to take them in the venue and how many and what direction. And I'll send you a little diagram of like this is I need you to stand in these corners and because I, I have a very specific way I like to shoot things so that I understand what I'm looking at. A lot of times people take photos and if they don't take them in an organized fashion, I can't tell what I'm looking at. Um, and so uh, they just take a couple and then I don't, I was like, I don't understand how this is actually fitting in, which is also why I've moved more and more towards LIDARs because I just send someone and just have them just shoot the whole thing, you know, then I can figure out what's going on. Noah Sarge. I think checklists are a great ways, great way to systematize what you're doing, especially if you do the same types of projects over and over and over again. Studiobinder.com is linked. Roscoe, excellent resource there. Um, so please check that out. Great resource, like I said. Um, I, I unfortunately am kind of like Alex, where every project is a little bit different. So I might have like a master checklist and then slim that down to the only the questions that are relevant for that shoot. Um, but like Alex, I, I, I do need to make sure I'm uh, up to date with those lists. Sky. Yes, and I also recommending that studio binder that, that Roscoe put up there for us because, as, again, as a one person, 
you you can't think of everything. And if you if you don't have a big crew that's you know responsible for little the tiny de details, a checklist is always going to help you. You know, hopefully make sure everything happens that's supposed to or you don't need to take all that stuff maybe you don't need all that stuff and you your checklist is yeah you can leave that out for the shoot alex yeah and there's certain things that are part of that list that you want to, <laughs> to have like i want to know if there's a doc <laughs> like there's a, if there's a doc in the building that i can get through i want to if not i want an egress i want to know exactly how i'm going to get to where i have to put my equipment from the from the street and is that going to be a dock is that going to be a door is that going to be and, and is it going is there any stairs <laughs> you know like these are the, the kind of things or even a bump like i want to know if there's a three inch bump um on the way there anywhere i want to know what that is i want to know where it is because we either have to build a ramp for that you know if we're bringing in uh, cases, you can create a huge traffic jam with three inches, um, where suddenly all these things have to have, you have to have four people lift, 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 lift to get it up over that, over that piece. Um, and especially when you have cases that are three or 400 pounds, it's a big deal. So, um, uh, so you, you want to know whether those are, you know, how am I getting in? What are the width? What is the width of the, um, of the elevator, of the, of, of all the doors, any door I have to go through, I need to know what the width is. I want to know how big is the elevator. And that is, by the way, is where polycam is super useful because you can go into an elevator and just go around. It's nice, small polycam does it really well. And you get, you can measure that out because you're not, you want to know how much gear can you get in on every load? Does that elevator have a key access to the floor that I'm trying to get to? Does the, you know, and, and if it has a key access and I'm showing up at 5 a.m., will there be a person with the key? <laughs> you know, like that's, these are all the little things, you know, like, like, so you try to back up and, and some of these, the reason you want to send, a lot of times we send people that are experienced to do these. I don't send someone who hasn't done a lot of events typically to do a walkthrough because I need them to ask these questions, you know, and, you know, if I, it has a satellite truck ever been uh, parked here? And if so, where did they park? You know, and then if so, where did the wires go? You know, like how do they get the fiber from the satellite truck to to my to the location that we we're going to? Um, and it, does that go over any areas that are going to be in a walkway? So do I need to tape those down or or throw down yellow jackets or whatever that's going to be to protect that? And so these are all the things. These are the kind of things you put in that list. Um, and then a lot of times, if I have someone that hasn't done a ton of of location scouting, I, I go, I need you to, I need them to tell you where you're going to load out. I need you to walk with your phone on a video. I need you to just walk all the way to where I'm going to go. So at least I have a video of all of the, like I can see what's going on, but the minimum, I just want them to walk through that, that pipeline of how they're going to get there. Um, and, uh, and then with that list, and a lot of times they're calling it out while they're talking. Um, and sometimes we do it over zoom too. So, so that we can talk to them about that. Chris Fenwick. Uh, you also have to be careful of, Sometimes there's little tiny innocuous details that can absolutely throw your load in off. I recently had to load into the uh, a retail establishment in Union Square. And it seems straightforward. And the site survey said, yeah, you're going to go through the side door and then you're going to come through the back. And we had an extremely compressed window. We had to, we had like 90 minutes to do our whole loading. It was stupid. And, um, what somebody didn't notice was that from the side door and going in, there's an, that there was a, an elevator that went up the equivalent of like three steps. You went in this door, up three steps level, and then out the other door. And nobody noticed that there was an elevator there. And what that meant is it, considering how short the load in was, it really slowed down the load in because everything had to go through the airlock of that elevator. It wasn't an actual airlock, but essentially an airlock of an elevator. And when you glance at it and you go, oh, that door, we come in here. Okay, fine. What Alex just said, walk the whole thing. And don't leave out a detail of, oh, you have to go through a little elevator. But it's no big deal. It's not a problem. Really? No. Like, is that elevator padded? You know, like, does it? I was just going to say, you know, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a it wasn't a guest elevator. Uh, it was the Louis Vuitton store. It was a freight elevator, but still, it was uh, it it really slowed things down. And I've I think seen you, someone stop for half an hour though. We got to get elevator pads. You all just sit here and do nothing. Well, and, and we get that done. 
and and if you're in a nice place, you ask more questions, you know, like, like one thing about the, um, there for the four seasons, for instance, there are only certain types of wheels that they want you to, to go through the lobby with on your, on what you're doing. And, and so you have to be very careful or you have to use their, um, you know, bell, bellman racks to get a gear through there. If you're not going to come through, if, if you're going to come through the front or you're going to go anything through their main area, they, if you take regular rock and roll wheel, rock and roller wheels, woo, they get super excited really fast. So, um, and, uh, and so the, um, uh, the managers will come out really fast and, and talk to you about that. So, so you do have to know, again, especially in fine, if you, if things start to look really shiny or you're going to somewhere where there's, you know, a lot of people with shiny cars, uh, you really need to ask everything about all of those things, um, you know, to make sure you're clear of what can be touched and what can't. And yeah. No, and then we'll come back to Chris. You should probably ask if it's in the desert, if there's sand and if it's going to take a week to wash it all off. <laughs> <laughs> doing a rocket launch this the, the dust is a little hard to get rid of but like it takes like three weeks chris fenwick funny you mentioned the the wheels uh alex i was i had finished a gig in uh, some some place whatever and i had one more night i was going to stay i had been in the convention center across the way from the hotel and i had a rack full of gear that i wasn't comfortable leaving in my personal vehicle overnight in the hotel parking so i rolled it from the parking garage through a side door of the hotel, not the front door. And I'm, and I'm just gonna just push it past the front desk, go to the elevator, take it up to my room for that night. As I go by the front gas uh, desk, somebody yells at me, Oh, Oh, sir, sir, I'm sorry. You, you, you can't bring that through here. And without missing a stride, as I'm pushing past, I looked over and I said, it's okay. It's hotel wheels. And they went, Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to know the language, right? The magic words. Oh, they understood or that. Pretend or like pretend like oh, you to. Pretend word, yeah. I, I, I will say that that confidence in many of these things get gets you a long way uh, in, in most of those things. Cause, and a yeah. clipboard. Yeah. That is huge. I can't tell you the number of times I just walked into the back of a huge restaurant through the kitchen. And because I've gone through kitchens so many times, you know the attitude, right? Hey, is the coffee back here real quick? I just <laughs> got coffee. And if you feel like, you know, if they think you you belong there, they will let you be there. <laughs> if they don't think you belong there, if you're looking around and you don't know where you're going, they'll toss you out. Uh, Ranjan Shadil in the, in the chat says, listening to a location is important as well. Many sounds that may not be considered uh, sometimes are there, which may delay filming. And it, that is very true. We're also oriented on the visual part of this. And as people who make visual content, I think that's pretty pretty reasonable but yeah sound is a huge deal yeah it's it it's a great point and we uh, a lot of times i sit and check my email inside of the venue that i'm going to be in and i just sit there and just check my email for a little bit by myself like and i can I just sit here for a minute and while i'm doing that i'm listening for exactly what uh what he's talking about is just listening for am i hearing you know any kind of ancillary stuff that's you know showing up and a lot of times you do and then you got to figure out where that's coming from yeah, there's an ice machine over there and it's got a compressor and it didn't wasn't on before and now it's kicked on and suddenly I can't do any live sound. Those are not fun moments. Uh, next question. Rob Collins, Kansas City, Missouri. Would using a 360 camera make scouting photos of an area easier or not for you? I've never done that. I don't know. Right. Alex, I know you do a lot of 360. Would any use in that for you? Yeah, yeah. I, I have, um, sorry, I'm... I'm uh, I'm trying to take pictures of some of what we do here. <laughs> so I'm going to a couple different windows all at the same time. Um, the, uh, uh, I use a 360 camera. That is something I take almost all the time. Almost, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's something I use all the time and, and I use a little theta. And so a lot of times I'll take a lot of photos, but I'll just lift my fa theta up like this. And you'll see, I have lots of pictures of how much hair I'm losing um, because I have, you know, that you see the top of my head all the time and you see click, 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 or I'll look up and click. But I, it's also kind of fun. I will say that you go back to all the theta, you know, to, to all these things. And I have lots and lots of 360 photos because sometimes you send those to folks and they don't really understand what the photos mean. But when they get the 360 photo, they can move around it and immediately understand what the reference is. And so getting 360 photos is, is really, really useful um, for, for that, um, that information. So the theta is all I use um, for most of those, those photos when I'm walking through because it's, it, I can fit it in my pocket. 
um, it's fast. I send them to other people and have them take them, and it's really, really useful. Uh, next question, I think. Yeah. Next Albie question. Lopez, San Antonio, Texas. Albie wants to know, when scouting locations for live streaming in public spaces, conference rooms, what are some of the tools or resources to check for network reliability? Alex. The IT team. Like, don't don't plug stuff in to try to figure that out. I've done that. Um, I, I have in the past used, you know, the net, the, the link runners, uh, you know, that that are made. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of different ones that you can that you can get. But, you you know, um, the response if you're in a let's say something like the White House is someone will run in and go, hey, what are you doing there? And, and, and then you'll be like, oh, I'm just checking something out. Like, oh, let's not do that. <laughs> like, you know, like, cause it'll tell you every device it went through to get to the internet. Like it, it, it'll just go, I went through this, this piece of hardware. It'll just go all the way through it. And I'll tell you all those things that IT hates that. Um, and so, so you just want to ask people, uh, I have this port, mark the port numbers that you're dealing with. And then, you know, so know what the numbers are, where they are in the, in the room that you want to use them in and then make requests related to those port numbers um, with pictures or take pictures of them because sometimes they don't know what the port number is, but they know that, oh, you're not in the right box. I'm like, that's not the right box to plug this into. You'll say, oh, I don't have any internet. Well, you're in the wrong place. They don't know what the port number is. They just know that this is the box. And when you show them the picture of the box, they'll say, oh, go over to the fourth port over and plug in there and then you'll have it. Um, so, so you have to kind of take the port numbers, take the pictures of the location, take, you know, make sure that you know what those things are. Um, but be very careful of, of using devices inside of their network. Um, if, especially if it's a nice facility, they're not going to appreciate it. And we've got 15 minutes left and quite a few questions left. So Noah, real quick. Sure. Time of day, try to match the time of day that you're doing the same uh, streaming time for. If, if somebody else in the area is doing a major upload, I had that at a corporate company where the law firm hit go and it crashed our stream. So check for that. Um, yeah, go through the IT that's best for firewalls and approval. And then if they sometimes they'll give you a dedicated slice of the Internet as well. And next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. When scouting historic sites like the first rotating jail and one of the last three, other than the standard things, what might be a necessary ask for these unique locations? Alex. Um, if you need to use carpet squares. <laughs> you know, so, you know, uh, one of the things about it is, is that you really want to ask that ahead of time. Like how many, do I need to use carpet squares? Um, do you provide the tables? Um, what can we touch and what can't we touch? You're going to assume nothing other than the floor. Um, you know, what are areas of where on the floor is there? Um, also where, obviously where the power is, where can you run things out of it? You, you, things like cable runs become much more complicated because you can't just run them out the window, you know, because they might, that might scuff something. And so you really want to think about that. In general, this is more of a problem. We could probably do a whole second hour on loading. But, so we can think about that, but that's probably a good follow-up to this one. <laughs> so anyway, but one thing about it is, is that in general, you want to look at what you're going to set things on, and especially in a historic area, but generally any nice area, is think about what you're going to put on the surfaces. So um, I, I'm pretty touchy about people putting anything that's hard on another surface without a at least duvetine. You know, so we bring out and lay out, you know, if we're going to put, use a table, You'll see us roll duvetine out or roll sound blankets out or do something where our hard things are not touching, you know, their, their surfaces, you know. And so, um, but, but in historical environments, you really want to think about, about that. Um, can you plug into the power? Like what kind of power do they have? Um, and, and then again, you know, how are you going to run things out? If you're going to run cables out of the building, can that door stay opened? Um, do you have to build a break point at that door? So you may have to get to a point where at night, to keep it secure, you have to have plug in and out right there. You can't just run your cable out there. It has to plug into something and plug out of something so that you can un unlink that and shut the door for security. So you have to kind of think through, you know, where those things are. Sometimes it's also a little bit of theater. I had a circumstance where I was shooting in a museum kind of area and the docent was just all over us and that was supposed to be watching us. And I just, it, it, in her hearing said, all right, Every piece going in needs two people. I want a pusher and a steerer. And that steerer's only responsibility is to make sure that none of this stuff comes in contact with anything. And I watched her temperature go down from about 95 to about 50 just by having said that. Sometimes letting people know that you are going to take this as seriously as they do um, 
does a lot to get them on your side. You, you want to, they're worried and they're worried because their job's on the line if you mess up. So if you do something, whether it's that or something else to make them feel like you hear them and you're taking active measures to do what they need done, it really makes everything a whole lot easier. Next question. Bob Sturdivan from San Antonio, Texas. Recommendation on what a person should do to prepare for a location scouting career. Who to contact first? Noah. This is a great question. I am also from San Antonio, Texas, so I have a connection with you, Bob. Um, first off, I would say I want to emphasize it is a career. People do spend their life focused on just um, doing locations and, and not just scouting, but uh, it's a whole department and there's teams of people on Hollywood sets and other, where, and, uh, other places in the world. So um, it's a big it's a big world out there. Lots of things are happening. So I, I would start by being as proactive as you can talking to the San Antonio Film Commission or whatever resources are local. Austin obviously has a much bigger uh, market for that kind of stuff too. If you're trying to stay local, that might be an area to look into. Um, get on as many small productions as you can and just get used to being on set and get fam familiar with that process. Um, the locations people tend to be people persons, people people, <laughs> uh, where they're friendly and just kind uh, because they have to deal with a lot of uh, connecting people and asking people questions. And like I said earlier, dealing with the public and their comments. But another thing is, uh, is you got to ask yourself if, if you're willing and able to do the time commitment uh, needed for these shoots, because a typical day on set is like 14 hours. Um, and so that's something that not a lot of people are new to the industry are used to. So I don't have a specific person or thing, but that's the advice I'd give. Sky. Well, Noah, did you join either the producer guild or the director's guild? Were either of those resources for you? I almost the DGA, but I did not complete it before I started my own business and started doing my own thing. Yeah, that's, uh, hmm. um, it's, it's its own specialty. And I will say that this reminds me a little of voiceover in this one little area. The people who did the work are the people who had flexible enough schedules so that when they had a call to do a VO at two o'clock in the afternoon for a live session, you had to be ready to do that. If you were trying to do a full-time job and do this, it was very difficult because you had to say no a lot. I know that puts a lot of stress, particularly if in a market where there's not a lot of this going on. It reminds me a little of and so voiceover. sometimes you have to this kind of balance I want to do this, but I can't really devote it full time at this point. And then you just have to do, I think uh, Noah's suggestion was really good. Meet the people who are doing it. I will guarantee in any major size city, there is somebody who's doing this work or somebody who works that market a lot because there's just too much production out there and people need people to do these things. But it's often also catch as catch can. You'll work for a couple of weeks on something and then, you know, your job is done and they go on to the production and you have to find the next source of income. So it's it can be a little iffy. Uh, uh, let's see. We took care of Sky. So next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Do you do interference scanning when you're setting up for locations where you're using either wireless mics or Wi-Fi? I have a couple Android apps for this, but would love iOS recommendations. Noah. Yes, 100%. Do it twice. Do it three times. Do it 10 times. <laughs> um, <laughs> interference is a big deal, especially for audio wireless microphones. Um, I have a physical scanner. I don't have an OS device, and I, I don't have any recommendation recommendations around that specifically, but absolutely. Um, even even when you do your scout, it's going to be different on the day as well. So you, you just want to try to do as many uh, scans as you can. And I know sure it has um, like a desktop app. Um, but yeah, you, you want as much data as you can on that. Yeah, I got away without it most of the time working in a market like Phoenix, which is, you know, big market, but not a huge market. And it isn't that much because the corporate stuff was far enough usually away that Los Angeles, I imagine it would be a nightmare in New York. I would imagine it would be a triple nightmare. And there are circumstances like at NEB where you have 8 million people trying to use all the bandwidth for everything that you absolutely must do frequency coordination. I never had that big a problem with it, but I, better safe than sorry. And I agree with Noah in that respect. This is not something you want to find out is a problem on day of shoot. Next question. And it's from Rajan Shandil in Los Angeles, California. What shared services do you use to communicate immediate updates? Google Drive, Slack, or whatever? Uh, we have nobody in on this right now. Uh, I will say that we've been using uh, just Google Sheets to good effect in terms of our coordination uh, live on there. Noah, you had thoughts? Yes, I, I use the one that makes the most sense and will get everybody on the production. I, because there's dozens of all of these communication apps, to me, they all relatively do the same thing, but it's about notifications and making sure everybody is succinct 
and everybody has the understanding that we're all going to be checking that app on a regular basis, um, whether it's Google Drive or Slack or whatever, whatever communication tool you're using. Um, Discord tends to be a very popular one with our community here. Um, and hello, Raj. Yeah. yeah, isn't it interesting? We've gone through so many of those. I remember never having used WhatsApp. And then I did a couple of things where everybody was on WhatsApp. Uh, that was with people coming in for NAB one year and somebody had set it up from uh, offshore and we all used it, had a great time on it. And then it went away and I never used it again. So it's interesting how many uh, competing products are, but you just need some products so that everybody, every in the morning you get up and you can see the current rundown of all the things you need to know about. It's an important part of the communications process. Next question. From Douglas Carmichael, for event venues, have you ever sent an advance sheet to the venue before the show arrives? Uh, no one's clicked in on this one either. I have not, uh, not to the venue. Usually we have all those uh, contracts in place beforehand, and often the client is paying the venue directly in my experience. That usually doesn't go through me as a vendor to the client, usually doing something like that. But I can certainly see circumstances where you would need uh, coordination with that. And in terms of the fact that the advance sheet often presents contact information for as many people as possible. That's going to do you nothing but good when you suddenly need to get a hold of the manager of the restaurant at the facility where everybody needs their food coming out, you know, their to-go food containers on time. You've got to have that number or you're in deep trouble. Uh, Alex, more thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of times if you're working with a company, you you will send some version of a rider um, to the like if I'm working with a larger production company or another one, I'm going to send them um, that rider definitely sending the ve the venue schedules of this is when we're planning to go in uh, having a lot usually we end up with a lot of meetings with them of uh, figuring those things out and, you know, drawing things out the more you can send to them the more that they, they know what to expect the better. And next question. From Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington, how do you feed the crew? Oh, craft services, Mitchell. Well, if it's during the shoot, you do do craft services by bringing somebody in to cater. It's the way to do it. You don't want to send them away from the shoot location to deal with that. Afterwards, you can probably get away with uh, sending them with a per diem, which is normal. Uh, but uh, just make sure you don't send them somewhere when you need them to come back at a specific time. Alex. Uh, to Sky's point, I think that when you're doing a walkthrough, you do need to find out what, where are they going to eat? Like, where is it okay to eat? Where is it not okay to eat? You also want to know what are their restaurants that are nearby? So it may not be okay to eat anywhere. And so then, then you have to figure out, okay, if there's a walk away or if there's somewhere, where am I going to plant my crew? Um, so when you're trying to figure it out, where will they plant for, for, um, for meals? It's got to be somewhere. And where can you drop coffee? <laughs> like that's always, that's always the thing I want to know is where are we putting the coffee, the Starbucks uh, carton? Where is that going to go? Um, and are you allowed to bring food into the venue? So you may be in a, in a conference area where they, you have to order the food from them or you have to leave the facility and you can't bring your own food in at all. So because um, they, they want to get that $125 a head per meal and for the food that isn't very good for you and you should never eat. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so that, that's the um that's what you want to look at there and definitely we do a lot of research on also what what's going to be door dashed what's going to be what can be ordered what can be you know those types of things chipotle by the way has a great ordering system built in <laughs> so we, we, we were very addicted to them because all over because it's really easy to send everybody an invite and everyone just orders what they want and then someone just goes and picks it all up as one order um so you can send a pa a pa over so anytime there's a chipotle anywhere nearby we tend to gravitate towards it because it's so easy to order. Sky. Yes, that how do you make the order happen? Uh, COVID forced a lot of that onto the restaurants and you hand a, a phone around and you put all your orders in on that one device or somebody manages that for you. But also the difference between, again, the crew and the talent, maybe those don't intermingle. And your point about do they, how long is your meal break going to be? Is it a 30 minute break or is it an hour break? And to send somebody across the street even could be a two hour delay. And so that's a challenge. Yeah, because so, when you're doing these things, you do almost everything you can do to keep the crew from leaving. Like it's just, it just creates a whole bunch of, you know, people do, you know, people who want to save money will try to do walkaways. 
and I do everything I can do. I mean, sometimes we do them, but sometimes I, I do everything I can avoid to do a walk away because it creates a variable. I can't tell you how many times someone has gone out and then just not come back um, or not come back on time or been delayed or their dinner. They couldn't get their check. They couldn't get, you know, all of these things that you, so you really want to try to eliminate that variable. So to disguise point, you really want to pay close attention to how do you serve it in a way that keeps everybody where they need to be. And definitely um, if you're scouting for the talent, not only are you going to scout for where they're going to eat, but what is their egress to the building? So how are they going to arrive um, out of everybody's sight and in a secure fashion and get to the, the room that they need to get to uh, without having to interact with the public? Noah. I love all the logistics here, like trying to base, basically uh, utilize everybody's time well. For me uh, for, and the crews that I hire and work with, I, I found that if I just simply pay for people's food um, before, during, after shoots, it just boosts the comp company morale and, and people feel like I'm taking care of them. And so that's just been an easy win and an easy thing I act actually love doing for my crew. Uh, and it simplifies that whole process as well. Absolutely. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana, asked, the Apple Watch Ultimate has me thinking the waypoint markers may be a great boon for location scouting for drones. Thoughts? Hadn't actually thought of that necessarily. Um, waypoint, I think, was mostly about uh, setting up routes for long-range exercise folks. But Alex, you have thoughts? You know, for some of the larger, larger events, we've absolutely scouted them with drones. Uh, we haven't done the scouting inside the inside the building yet, because uh, most people will freak out if you turn a, a, a drone on inside of their facility. So, so that hasn't been, but I think it's a great idea. Um, I think that the new uh, DGIs would be perfect for that. The FP, you know, the, um, uh, the, the new uh, first person uh, drones, I think could be really interesting because they've got a lot of protections to not damage things. They've got the little rails on them. And so the ones that have rails that, that may not hit things, but you would need to be certified as a drone operator because that is a commercial use of a drone. And um, you would need a lot of approvals from everybody to turn a motorized um, copter in, you know, on inside of a facility. And I got distracted and realized we're already at nine o'clock. So we've got about three more to do real mm -hmm. quick. Next question. Noah Sargent, Fullerton, California. Have you incorporated LIDAR scans in your scouts? Uh, Sky? Absolutely. And it helps you previs uh, off-site because you can put your camera in different locations and, and see whatever is in front of you. We kind of talked about it earlier. Alex? Yeah, uh, every every scout that I show up for now, um, I have a, I, I LIDAR it. You know, so it's, it's and here's the best part, is especially if you're working with a client you may work with in the future, once you LIDAR scan it, you have it forever. <laughs> so, so you, um, and so, and that means uh, you have, you can pre things, you can work out things, you can, um, what's great is that you may not get an approval to go to a, let's say a big stage, um, that might be, you know, for a festival or whatever, you may not get approval. If you, if you call them out of nowhere and said, could I come and just scan your location, getting them to do that might be hard. If you're doing an event there and say, Hey, can I just, and, and I have to admit I'm a little, I'm, I just walk in and ask if I can take photos. And then I say, can I, t is it okay if I, if I use this as a 360 uh, camera? Can I, can I go ahead and I, I don't try to explain what LIDAR is. I just say, I, can I take 360 imagery of the, of the, cause technically it is imagery. It's just, that it's imagery with a lot of data. So, um, so anyway, so I, I just ask if I can take imagery usually. And, um, and then I just, and I do it to people who are, sim if, if they ask what it is, I totally explain that it's LIDAR and it takes little points and I explain, I give them the whole thing, but otherwise it ties me into a conversation that they don't, you know, if, if people don't ask, they don't understand it and they're not going to, it's going to be a long conversation trying to figure it out. So, um, but anytime you go to a venue, that's the one time you have access and they're going to say, okay, so get as much data as you can. Next question. Roscoe Jones and in Madison, Indiana. Do you also use breakdown sheets and forms which depend on location info? And nobody has pushed in on that. Um, oh, Alex, you want to do it real quick? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely have, uh, we don't have forms necessarily that we fill out, but we definitely have things that we're looking for for each, each one of these locations. And then we try to deliver as much of that data as we can, depending on the time and and uh, resources that we have to the to the um, the people who need it. Um, I will say that we don't send it to everyone. I mean, when you start gathering lots and lots of data about a facility, you start to decide who needs to have that data and who doesn't, um, because it's potentially uh, a liability as well. Makes sense. Uh, let's go to the last question. Rajan Shandil from Los Angeles, California. Has anyone heard of the LMGI? It's a great group, and the magazine has a lot of information. 
and uh, Sky is going to help us with I this. I just started viewing it. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. It's some, again, insights and information that I hadn't thought about. Looks great. Okay, I think we've managed to get to the end of this. Thank you, everybody, for participating in today's topic. Um, I was just trying to get the list of what's coming up because we've got a new little thing. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, what does it say here? I, oh, it doesn't say here. I got the wrong one. Um, so I know, um, what is the topic tomorrow, Alex? I don't know. I don't, do that. I don't know that. I don't know that the day before. You're Let's asking me very complicated questions here. Um, I, I have to. I have to make, go back and look at the email there. So, so Isadora's tomorrow. Oh, no, no, we're talking about. I'm sorry. Oh, we're that's talking, right. After tomorrow the we're show. talking about 2.5. So it, it took me a little minute. To, you, if you throw me, throw me something angle, it takes me a minute to think about. No, it. No, no, so, no. I, and I should have um, had this up. It's, I just uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about 2.5. So we're going to be talking about office hours and just what we're the changes that we're making. We've already made some of the changes. You, you probably didn't even notice. Uh, so we have already moved to um, to Zoom ISO 2.0. X. I don't know exactly which version. Um, so that's already that's already happened. So we'll talk a little bit about what's what we're going to be working on over the next couple of weeks, um, and uh, give you kind of a preview of that. Um, there's a lot of changes happening in October, um, but hopefully most of the new infrastructure will be in place by uh, the first week of November. Um, and then, but I'm sure that there'll be some little glitches here and there. We thought we were going to move all the hardware over um, this weekend, but we're going to give it a couple more weeks so we can uh, do a little bit more uh, pre work. And we're pushing into the nine o'clock hour. Isadora with L is right now, I guess. So yes. incredible opportunity to learn how to use Isadora for your own product project. Um, this week's events, Audio Day moves. Is that happening next week? Audio Day is moving to Wednesday. Wednesday. So yeah. Yes. So the topic for 1019 will be Dante. So if you want to learn about Dante, do that. And there's a volunteer sign up uh, for Super Saturday. So remember that that is happening. Uh, I'm doing the final cut thing tomorrow at noon. And I think there's one other thing on the calendar, which I don't remember. And unfortunately, this isn't scrolling for me. So I'm sorry about that. We'll be better at this. This is a whole new closing thing that I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around. And I did not do a good job. But thank you all. Thank you very much for coming and helping us on Thursday talk about all this stuff. Great second hour. I learned a lot of things. I hope you did as well. Uh, and I appreciate everybody who was here. Uh, always the panelists, you did a magnificent job of helping everybody learn more about location scouting. We'll all be here um, again tomorrow doing the same thing. And remember, After Hours opens now. Finally, we're going to roll the credits and pay attention to all the people who have worked in the back end to help bring this to you. Thanks for watching. I thought that was a really good discussion. Thanks, everybody. It was awesome. Just the, the little details that you don't think about, like parking and bathrooms. So many little tips, and I yeah. figured we would get those. And that, that checklist from Roscoe is an awesome starter. All right, there you go. See you all tomorrow. Good job.